I think 2023 is opening the door for a recession. We're expecting either slow growth or a mild recession. There's a lot more signs now of a pretty clear inflection point in both the growth and the inflation numbers. What we've had is the flop. We're still kind of waiting for the chop. you got to concentrate on, you know, I, I think surviving the difficult <coughs> start to next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. 26 is not cold. It's not cold. That is negative three centigrade. <laughs> By definition, that is freezing. <laughs> it's not cold. Get the right gear. From New York City this morning. <laughs> so a freezing New York City. <laughs> it's not freezing. It's By definition, it is freezing. Good morning, good morning. Exactly. It is CPI Tuesday. Can we agree on that? The data coming out a little it bit later exciting. this morning. And, and very nuanced. This is not... A, this is not normal. This is a really nuanced report at 8.30. Going into the Federal Reserve yeah. tomorrow, Tom, the week ahead is a pretty big one. I frankly wonder if this is more interesting than the Fed meeting. Uh, last time I was wrong on that, the Fed meeting last time was wrong. But It's going to set the time I'm for sorry, that news this conference. this is not, folks, another inflate, you know, it's not CBI Tuesday and all that. It's serious. It's It could be a J.P. Morgan with that publication of an equity pop if you get under 7%. Well, that's if you get a severe downside yeah, surprise severe. on Grand. CPI and Look no one's looking for anything. Afternoon. Sub 7% a little bit later this morning, Lisa. I'm just thinking about it. It's not CPI no. Tuesday. It's CPI Tuesday. We're actually <laughs> going to enjoy it today. Right. I mean, honestly, I'm curious right. to see if you look under the headline number services inflation versus goods inflation and how that gasoline price really weighs in, given that gas prices are the lowest since October right. 2021. Are you on the phone, is, too? Is, I'm on with my stable coin people. Oh, right. I'm trying to find out if my stable coin is it still stable? It's still stable. It's still stable. Do you want to talk about the arrest we'll of Sam Bankman Fried? No, we'll talk about this later, but I, I want to move the story forward. We're going to do that with Shanali Basic. <laughs> Shanali's going to join us down in yeah, Washington we, alongside yeah. Anne-Marie. We've still got a hearing that's going to come at 10 a.m. Eastern time. I'm moving forward from that. I'm Maxine Waters. I'm looking at Binance. I'm learning about Binance as fast as I can. I really don't know that all much about it. But this is uh, serious stuff. We're now at the point where it's the legal dash. Why are you focused on that this morning and not Sam oh, Bankman-Fried? Because this is the next thing to fall, and they're way bigger, and it's way more international. This was one guy. We're going to get the actual complaint. The indictment will be unveiled today. And, and, and I lot. will Fair. understand Fair. what the allegations are and how broad it will be. The focus <clears> very much still on the treatment of him, where the allegations of malfeasance really are. That will color the whole discussion yeah. for the broader industry. He's not worried about the inflation report. I'm moving on again to Binance, John. I think it's way serious. There's percolating Reuters with an important article about a, de a Department of Justice divided inside about what to do with Binance. But what, if, what intrigues me is this idea of stablecoin, which is the same debate as a money market fund years ago. Do you break the buck was the question. Do you break the value of a stablecoin to me is the heart of the matter. Just to be clear here, you mentioned the Reuters story. That's about the risk of criminal charges over breaking money laundering rules, correct? Yeah, and there's a debate within Department of Justice, but we're just, all of a sudden things are getting sped up. That's my number one question to Shanali. Let's whip through the price yeah. action. We'll catch up with Shanali in about 10 minutes' time. Equity futures are <coughs> positive by four-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. It's CPI data coming in about a couple of hours and 30 minutes, two hours and 30 minutes away. Look at the bond market. <coughs> yields just a little bit lower by two basis points on a 10-year, 358 91. Tom, a whole lot lower since the Fed last met on both the two-year and on the 10-year as well. Big pop yesterday afternoon and, you know, a correlation there. I, you know, the real yield, John, is sort of like where it is is how I'd put it. And inversion didn't do much. But equity markets uh, moved. And as you mentioned, they move again up four or five tenths of a uh, percent. On the inflation front, and we'll get to this through the entire show, Dominic Constant with us, my smartest note this morning, and he made it very clear service sector inflation is going to be tough to tackle. Dollar a whole lot weaker yeah. since the Fed last met as well. Yeah. You wonder if that breathes some life back into the inflation story. Bramo, euro dollar this morning basically unchanged at about 105. Hard to get some direction ahead of this report. 8.30 a.m. is the key data point of the day. CPI year over year, if it comes in at 6.9%, then you could see a 10% pop in the S&P 500. That was J.P. Morgan's prognostication, the idea of a severe downside surprise. I think that, Tom, your point about services side inflation is the key one. How much do you see that continuing to percolate up and offset some of the goods disinflation that we see? That is definitely what the Fed has said that they have been looking at. Today, we will also be awaiting that 
that 10 a.m. hearing in the U.S. House of Representatives, we're saying Sam Bankman-Fried will not be attending because he is currently uh, in, being held in a Bahama court and going to be indicted in uh, U.S. federal uh, prosecutors coming out with that indictment later this morning, unveiling the charges. He will be extradited to the U.S. What do we get in terms of what the problems were here? How do they cast this? That's why I really am curious about that indictment. At 1 p.m., the U.S. Treasury will sell $18 billion of 30-year notes. And it is worth, Tom, waking up before the 2 p.m. game that you will go and wake up for. Got because, right. honestly, yesterday's 10-year auction was terrible. John, by some metrics, it was the worst since 2009. Why? Because the rally has left a lot of people wondering whether there still is value. It came in, people demanded yields that were the bit most relative to where it was trading pre-auction going back to 2009. And it raises questions about whether perhaps yeah. this rally has gone too far too fast. John, how do you respond to a more retail analysis that says the 10-year yield is 3.5, 3.60% and inflation's whatever it is, 6, 7, sure. 8%. That's a massively negative inflation adjusted 10 year yield, not like the real yield that we talk about day to day. So, next week, or rather tomorrow, we're going to get a dot plot from the Federal Reserve, and it could show a terminal rate climb to as high as 525. What you're doing by looking at a 10 year at about 360 is suggesting that we've got rate cuts in our future, and inflation's going to be a whole lot lower, and growth as well, Tom. That's ultimately what you're doing here. And ultimately, also, you're making the call that maybe yields go lower from here, which I think is what a lot of people are lining up to say coming into this week and going into the new year. Most and certainly based on the last, you know, I, I mean, the market to me was two parts. It was before 2 p.m. yesterday and after. And clearly yesterday's lift in the market was to get out front of 8.30 this morning. I don't think it's unusual to have a sloppy auction going into a lot of event risks. I agree. CPI I, I this morning, Federal that. Reserve tomorrow. Ibrahim Ratbari joins us now, Global Head of FX Analysis at City. Ibrahim, if we can just begin with a CPI report at a little bit later this morning. Can you run us through what you and the team are looking for? Yeah, great to be with you. And we do think this is a really interesting uh, CPI report. It's going to determine the narrative. We had a low report last month, but this year we never got two soft readings in a row. So if we get the consensus expectation, which is also cities, of a 0.3% month-to-month <clears throat> -month increase in CPI, then I think this idea that inflation is peaking out and is, is more or less on track for the Fed will gain a lot more traction, and that would weigh on yields, would weigh on the dollar, and probably support broader risk appetite. <clears throat> For choice, I think the risk is a little bit to the upside. Again, the house call is just in line with, with the consensus forecast of three-tenths, uh, but I think it's between three-tenths and four or five, uh, and that is mostly because we did get some very large and probably noisy uh, declines uh, last month, and there might be a little yeah. bit of uh, retracement uh, after the big figure fun of 2022, are you enthusiastically positioning for big figure moves next year? Or are you just trying to get to, say, January 31st is a working number? I, I have a lot of sympathy with the idea of getting to January 1st and then maybe even beyond the first month. So we're looking at 2023 as a big transition year, and particularly for the dollar, we think we're transitioning from the most dollar supportive regime, a lot of safe haven demand, no other safe havens, and the U.S. was outperforming, to probably something closer to the opposite, maybe very late in the year, bottoming global growth, bottoming equity markets, and if yields are peaking, plenty of other safe havens. But where exactly that transition takes place during the year, I think, is very hard to call. And just as Lisa said earlier, we do have a lot of sympathy with the idea that that rally in fixed income that we've seen over the last two months has gone a little bit too far. So we see upside risk in rates and the dollar into the year, early in the year. But that's not going to be as durable as it was this year. Ibrahim, how much conviction do you have around that in order to perhaps lean against the narrative if this comes in as a softer CPI? In other words, basically say the underlying factors are still there to cause inflation to be persistent and more so than the market is currently uh, pricing in. Well, we, we have learned over the last couple of months that you really have to take each trading day as it is. And these moves can be so large, even on a daily basis, that you can't stand in their way or ignore them. So if the number comes in low, we are pretty confident that the market reaction is going to be significant, not nearly as significant as last month, both because it's the second soft number and because we have uh, the FOMC tomorrow. Nevertheless, certainly if the number is low, we wouldn't be buying dollars uh, on the day, and we would be cautious going into uh, tomorrow and the and the rest of the year. So you have to be you have to be tactical. Uh, and 
the price action yesterday did show us that investors, generally speaking, are still uh, uh, minded towards selling selling the dollar, selling dollar rallies, and, and maybe buying um, many of the other assets, both fixed income and in equities. For 2023, how much are you looking at global housing markets and the differentials there in order to determine what your call is? So we think housing is a is a is a very big topic, and in three ways. Number one, we think overall it underscores the idea that we're drifting into global recession. So we have fairly synchronized uh, housing market weakness uh, coming in. Number two, we do have significant deterioration, uh, significant uh, differentiation, because there are many economies where uh, that are much that have much larger housing vulnerabilities, where the share of floating rate mortgages is higher, house prices have risen more, household debt is uh, higher. Uh, in in G10, that includes Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Sweden, Norway, but also perhaps uh, the UK versus, let's say, the US, uh, many countries in the Eurozone or, or or Japan. So we do think there's differentiation that will be reflected in, in relative value in exchange rates. And then number three, the big elephant in the room for 2023 is what happens uh, to China and there also what happens to the real estate market. If that has some signs of life, then that's a major topic for markets. But it's also a major topic for the dollar because stronger Chinese growth, generally speaking, is associated with a much weaker dollar. So we think housing is a really big story for 2023, really across markets. Ibrahim, wonderful to catch up with you. You're not alone thinking that. It seems that every single FX strategist we speak to right now is talking about housing in respective geographies. Ibrahim Rakbari there of City, the latest from the SEC. Lisa, just reading this one through, as you are as well, charging Samuel Bankman Freed with defrauding investors. Yeah, and this comes alongside we're expecting to hear from the U.S. federal uh, prosecutors in the Southern District of New York to come out later today with their indictment unveiling that. How much this really raises questions about the broader implications, what he basically is saying, uh, that he promoted FTX as a safe, responsible crypto asset trading platform, especially touting its sophisticated automated risk measures to protect customer assets, perhaps overstating <clears throat> risk protection. Gary Gensler, SBF built, quote, a house of cards. Here's the quote. The Securities and Exchange Commission today charged Samuel Bankman Freed with orchestrating a scheme to defraud equity investors in FTX Trading, the crypto trading platform of which he was the CEO and co founder. Investigations as to other securities law violations and into other entities and persons relating to the alleged misconduct are on going. Much more on that coming up next. We're going to catch up with Shanali Basak down in Washington, D.C. Alongside Bloomberg Zambari, live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Disgraced FTX co-founder Sam Bankman fried has been arrested in the Bahamas after U.S. filed criminal charges. The Bahamian government says Bankman fried is being held pending an extradition process. Now, that arrest comes week after weeks of speculation that FTX's client funds were misused before the crypto exchange collapsed. Investors are awaiting U.S. inflation data that could shape the outlook for Fed interest rate hikes into next year. The Consumer Price Index is out at 8.30 New York time. A subdued CPI number would justify the Federal Reserve's projected half-point interest rate hike on Wednesday. Bloomberg's learned that China is delaying a closely watched economic policy meeting this week. That's because of a surge in COVID infections in Beijing. No word when that meeting will be rescheduled. China has warned it faces a big jump in the number of COVID cases after scrapping most testing and isolation of infected patients. Elon Musk's SpaceX is offering to sell insider shares at a price that would raise the company's valuation to about $140 billion. Sources tell Bloomberg the shares are being presented for $77 a piece. SpaceX was valued at $127 billion in July, according to data provider PitchBook. No word on whether the company will look to raise capital in a primary funding round. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
Breaking just moments ago, the SEC with this quote from the SEC chair Gary Gensler. We allege that Sam Bankman-Fried built a house of cards on a foundation of deception while telling investors that it was one of the safest buildings in crypto. There's an even stronger quote a little bit later in the statement released by the director of the SEC's division on enforcement who said the following. FTX operated behind a veneer of legitimacy, Tom. Mr. Bankman-Fried created by, among other things, touting its best-in-class controls, including including a proprietary risk engine and FTX's adherence to specific investor protection principles and details terms of services. But as we allege in our complaint, that veneer wasn't just thin, it was fraudulent. The SEC, in just moments ago. It is typical SEC, John, and, you know, not to play lawyer here, but I'd go to paragraph two, item three, which I think is the heart of the matter, and it's the heart of the matter forward for the industry, including Binance. Item three. Undisclosed risk stemming from FTX's exposure to Mr. Bankman-Fried's Almeida significant holdings of John, overvalued illiquid assets such as FTX-affiliated tokens. To me, that's the heart of the matter. It's this discussion of tokens. And I, I go back to Bank of International Settlements in Geneva. It's like, it's like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Who are these tokens? Do we know? I don't think we know. A lot of people have been asking, where are the authorities, Tom? Unlike Madoff, Madoff admitted to fraud. Straight out the gate, basically, which allowed authorities to clamp down on him pretty quickly. These guys yes. have clearly been putting a case together, at least at a headline that's just come through in just the last couple of minutes. For those who are just tuning in, Samuel Bankman-Fried charged with defrauding investors by the SEC. Well, it took so long, right, is perhaps the implication, because there was a, a lot of questions as Sam bankman fried <clears throat> paraded around with a series of interviews and public relations and talking about how, yeah, he messed up, or stronger words, but he had good intentions. What I thought was interesting about this release, FTX's collapse highlights the very real risks that unregistered crypto asset trading platforms can pose for investors <clears throat> and customers alike. That goes to your point, Tom. Let's get to this, and this will be through the morning as we look at inflation here in two hours, but also these events to 10 a.m. this morning. We'll have much more on this on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Shanali Basak and Anne-Marie Horton in Washington. Shanali, you look through this statement, it's widely expected, but there's always a surprise. Shanali, what is the surprise in Mr. Gensler's statement? We are looking at what the SEC is doing, and remember, we have now a charge to uh, uh, the scheme to defraud investors. Remember, we are expecting also the Southern District of uh, New York to also unseal an indictment later today. According to the New York Times, what that will include is charges of wire fraud, securities fraud, conspiracy of both, as well as money laundering. And so the scope of which this uh, scheme had unraveled relative to what we know Sam Bankman fried right. said himself, which is that he didn't knowingly commit fraud or he didn't knowingly commingle assets. Uh, there's a lot of detail. I just started looking through the SEC complaint that shows that uh, he was responsible here for what happened at Alameda and uh, the U.S. authorities finally, weeks right. later, are taking note. Shanali, an unfair question, but things are moving so quickly with the Reuters report last night of discussion at the Department of Just Justice and debate over Binance. Let's keep it as simple as that. How is the rest of the industry going to watch these hearings today and the news flow out of the Bahamas in legal authorities in the United States. There are a few things, Tom. One is a very simple discussion about how the SEC treats tokens. Do they treat them as securities? And remember, there's a lot of anxiety here in the venture world about this because there has been so much fundraising through tokenization in recent years. There's also this issue of how these assets are promoted. Remember, there's the House hearing today, but there's also the Senate hearing tomorrow regarding FTX, one of the speakers being Mr. <coughs> Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary, who was paid by FTX as a sponsor here. Uh, the other thing here, remember, to your point that you're making about finance, these investigations have been going on a very long time, years mm -hmm. actually. But over the last 24 hours, according to a report here by Nansen, data by Nansen, Binance has endured outflows as well as facing some uh, issues here regarding withdrawals of stable coins. Now, we don't know what kind of alarm there is in that scenario yet, but it's something to keep your eye on here as the industry really faces um, pressure. You do have CZ the head of Binance saying that these are one-to-one -one conversions, no margin or leverage involved, and they're trying to establish fluid swap channels in the future. But he said to feel free to withdraw any other stable coins, whether it's BUSD, USDT, 
et cetera. Uh, and so it's unclear what kind of pressure there is on the industry, but that is a situation, to your point, to there's watch. A, there's a political aspect here, not only because of the hearings, Anne-Marie, but also because in this SEC complaint, uh, there are allegations that Bankman Freed used commingled FTX funds to make undisclosed venture investments, lavish real estate purchases, and large political donations. This has come under a huge focus because he has been a huge donor politically. How does that color some of the hearings that we're going to be seeing today and tomorrow in, in Washington, D.C.? Well, he's not going to be showing up to the hearings, right? We do know that he was going to open up with a pretty blanket and direct statement saying that he messed up, but using a different, <clears throat> more... Uh, Ex explicitive word for that. What we should look back when it comes to how Washington has treated this individual, and he's talked about this, saying, you know, maybe if I give some more money to some lawmakers, they're a little bit more quick to pick up the phone and speak to me. Open Secrets has tallied it. And when it came to the 2022 midterm election cycle, for the Democrats, he was donor number two after George Soros. I had mentioned this yesterday because this was millions of dollars to the Democratic Party. Um, and an individual, a few individuals were saying that's not fair. He also gave to Republicans. That is true. He did give to both sides of the aisle, but it was millions to Democrats and it was thousands to Republicans. And I think what you've seen with this individual, and we've talked about this on this show, is that whether it was the media, whether it was uh, celebrities, whether it was lawmakers, there was a little bit more of a put the gloves on approach to this person. Everyone wanted him to succeed. At this point, he didn't. And it also raises questions about who would be a mega donor in the next election cycle, because he was up there. And, Marie, how much focus is there on trying to crack down now, perhaps compensate for the lack of focus, uh, perhaps the lack of protection that we have seen over the past recent months? Well, when I'm looking through the SEC uh, statement this morning, there's one thing that stands out to me. It's that FTX collapse highlights the very real risk that unregistered crypto asset trading platforms can pose for investors and customers alike. So maybe they're going to get a little bit more serious and double down on some of these trading platforms and this industry. Um, but I also think about what Senator Tester from Montana, a Democrat, said over the weekend on NBC on the Sunday shows. I want to read you this. This is, I knew you guys were going to ask me about regulation. He says, I've not been able to find anybody who's been able to explain to me what's there other than synthetics, which means nothing. The problem is if we regulated it, it may give it the ability of people to think it's real. People in Washington don't even think they should regulate it because they don't even want to give the message to investors that you should be in this space. AMH, thank you. Schnally, I want to squeeze this in. What do you make of the timing of this? That this is Good all question. taking place, that authorities are stepping in right before Congresswoman Maxine Waters has her big day of testimony on Capitol Hill. Uh, it's interesting. I was taking a quick look here at all the people on this committee alone, by the way, that took money from SBF. It's a super awkward situation, absolutely. And you wonder if they're going to be giving any of that money back. So uh, to their point, I think whether you're a lawmaker or a regulator here, you have to wonder how this had happened under their watch, especially with the closeness that the lawmakers had to this industry. But to the point uh, that you're making here, Maxine Waters herself said that it's time that uh, the, the Sam Bankman Freed had faced the process for justice, but the American public also deserves to hear from him directly under oath. Shinali Basak, AMH, to the both of you, thank you. TK, what do you make of that? Coincidence that this is all taking no, place in the last No, I think your question was dead on. You were, ruder, you were ruder than me. I was thinking the same thing. I don't think it's, you know, I think it's a catalyst to get to it before the hearings here because they must know things we don't know. I'm going to do a victory lap here for Lisa Abramowitz, Jonathan Farrow, and myself. Our quiet nailed this over the last three years. I'm not going to mince words. Is that your Every day, back? you and me, Lisa had to take the surveillance pencil and put it in our mouth so we would grit our teeth. Future's positive this morning. Much more on this breaking story. Still ahead.
Two hours away from inflation data in America, about 24 hours away from hearing from the Federal Reserve Chair Jake Powell. Equity futures coming into all of that, shaping up as follows. Futures positive a half of 1%, a lift here on the Nasdaq by a half of 1% also. The move on the S&P yesterday, biggest daily move of the month so far on the S&P 500. In the bond market, yields look like this on twos, tens, thirties. Yields just a little bit lower by a couple of basis points on a 10-year to 359.27, down by 330-year to 354. So this curve just a little bit flatter going into that Fed call tomorrow and CPI mm -hmm. later this morning. To finish on Euro dollar, just to round things out for you, Euro dollar looks a little something like this. 105.45 yeah. positive, a tenth of 1%. That's the price action. Let's get you the breaking news of the last 30 minutes or so. The SEC charging Samuel Bankman Freed with defrauding investors. They say Bankman Freed orchestrated a years long fraud to conceal from FTX's investors one, the undisclosed diversion of FTX customer funds to Alameda Research, the undisclosed special treatment afforded to Alameda on the FTX platform, including providing Alameda with a virtually unlimited line of credit funded by the platform's customers and exempting Alameda from certain key FTX risk mitigation measures. And finally, three, and Tom, you picked up on this a little bit earlier this morning, undisclosed risk stemming from FTX's exposure to Alameda's significant holdings of overvalued, illiquid assets such as FTX-affiliated tokens. The complaint further alleges that Bankman Freed used commingled FTX customer funds at Alameda yeah. to make undisclosed venture investments, lavish real estate purchases, and, Tom, large political donations. Which goes to the events this morning at 10 o'clock. I assume staffs of these politicians are rewriting the script uh, this morning. I really want to say, John, that the token discussion at item three goes to the heart of the research of Raphael Auer and his team at the Bank of International Settlements. BIS is hugely suspect about stablecoin and its supposed stability within an open, visible, audited market. As we were reading through the statement, Tom, you went straight to that quote from Gary Gensler. So allow me to share that quote with our audience again, the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, this morning in a statement, Lisa. We allege that Sam Bankman-Fried built a house of cards on a foundation of deception <coughs> while telling investors that it was one of the safest buildings in crypto. Basically talking about risk controls that ended up being less than there is also this hint, to Tom's point, about broader investigations, broader potential uh, malfeasance within the crypto space. What I find interesting, Tom and John, is that if you look at Ether, if you, Ethereum, if you look at Bitcoin, they're both up on the day. There is a question of why there hasn't been some sort of market-based wholesale skepticism as we watch <clears throat> potentially this as the first domino of potentially others. Well, it's gonna, we're going to have to see, and it's going to unwind here as we go through the morning again. To be clear, I'm watching the Binance News yesterday off the Reuters article and comments this morning out in the zeitgeist, and you know some of it is pretty sketchy, to be, to be fair, and we'll just have to see how that unfolds. We're going to try to stay on the rails here of a report in almost two hours on inflation. It is the focus of everyone in economics, finance, investment. We speak with Bruce Kasman, chief economist at J.P. Morgan. Uh, Bruce, I don't want you to play equity strategist, but your shop made a splash overnight with a 10 percent lift in equities if we get under a 7 percent inflation, 6.9 percent. Translate that for your strategists and our audiences this morning. How do we get to 6.9 percent? What kind of inflation is that? Well, it's hard for me to see that. We're looking for a number that prints 7.3. So I think you'd have to get that with a pretty big surprise to the downside on energy prices and then, of course, have the core number surprised. I think from the point of view of the Fed and from the point of view of the uh, market going forward, what really matters is the Fed's reaction and how it looks at the core. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think what we're seeing and what we believe we're seeing is a fairly sharp slide in inflation but one that's incomplete, one that's getting us into the 3 to 4% range on core inflation here. Uh, that's very good news in terms of where we've come from, but it's not enough to stop the Fed. And it does hold the risk that we get stuck right. here as we go through 23 and that that requires more action than the market is currently expecting. Your Friday Weekly Prospects is world-class in analysis of housing, not only individual homes, rentals and that, but also multifamily properties as well. What is the housing dynamic that we should look for in these inflation reports in two hours? Well, I think what you're seeing in the housing market is that the rental prices on the margin are coming off. But I think when you look at what's actually measured, which is the average price for the economy as a whole, it's going to continue to be up. We're looking for 
a seven tenth rise in shelter costs. I think the the dynamic in the core, if we leave aside energy for a moment, is really that goods prices are being pushed down by fading supply chains, rising dollar weakness in goods demand we've had globally with with particular weakness in China, and the continued stickiness in in, in service prices. Shelter is the big part of it in the CPI, but the broader story actually is services outside of shelter have not actually showed any signs of moderating. And I think as Chair Powell has made this point, uh, it's mo more closely tied to what's happening in labor markets. And this is why people are also looking at that pool of savings that people have that J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon came out and said could be eaten up by the mid-year of next year. How do you sort of look at that dynamic, at the ability of the consumer to borrow, keep spending, and that service-aside inflation that has proven to be sticky? Well, I think we have a multiple of forces working on the consumer right now. One, as you're saying, is we've used up a lot of that cushion and probably will use it up entirely over the course of the next year, year and a half. Um, that, though, is not a deficit. It just means you have less of a cushion. On the other hand, the fall in inflation is a rise in purchasing power. The dynamic of government uh, uh, policy has been taking away transfer payments through the first part of 22. And as we turn to 23, we're going to get big COLA adjustments. Um, so I think the key here is where labor markets are. Right now, labor income is still growing at a pretty rapid pace. If you don't hit that pretty hard, if you don't hit business spending, business hiring, the consumer is going to be fine. It's got lower inflation, strong labor income, and rising transfer payments. I've also been looking at China's reopening and, and trying to gauge out how this is going to affect inflation next year, even if service and inflation comes under control. How much could a reopening that's happening a lot sooner than people expected spur inflation back in the commodity sector that has seen disinflation recently and cause another bout later on next year? Um, I think there's two issues. First of all, when China reopens, it's not quite ready to reopen in terms of its uh, health care system, its immunization uh, uh, position. So there's a lot of uncertainty about how much lift you're going to get in the immediate sense. And I think one of the things we're going to see this week is the November data in China. It's going to be pretty ugly. The economy is looking quite weak as it ends the year. So I want to make the point that I think there's a big reopening to come in China. I don't think it's happening now, and I don't think we're going to have it right. hit uh, markets in the next two or three months. Having said that, when it does happen, I think you are going to see a, a very strong lift in growth. China has been seriously depressed by the uh, COVID problems, and it's going to continue to be so for a little while. Uh, and I think it will boost commodity prices. But inflation in the U.S. is not going to be driven primarily by commodity prices. It's going to be driven by the combination mm -hmm. of tight labor markets, inflation, psychology, uh, and what the Fed is doing to demand. And Dr. Kasim, Dominic Kasim over at Mizzou, you've, you and I have studied him for years, really talks about the shift here from a supply side analysis to a demand side analysis. In, in that service sector inflation will be more persistent, will have an inertial force, will have trouble coming down. Do we risk, as he talks about, as Dr. Constum talks about, do we risk the Fed, quote unquote, fixing service inflation and getting itself into trouble? Well, the Fed's got a difficult job here. Let's let's make that clear. What we're seeing right now is the supply chain problems, the commodity price pressures come off. Uh, those forces that they come off is giving us a relatively sharp drop in inflation. We've got up to about 9%. We're going to get down, as we, if we're right, below 4%, largely on that alone. However, as that stuff is coming off, the tightness in labor markets, the uh, pressures there, uh, the underlying continued support for demand in the service sector, and I think psychology are all factors. You can call that demand, but I think it is a mix of things that uh, we want to understand is driving it. It's moving in a way that's limiting and probably not going to allow inflation to get all the way back down to the level that the Fed is going to be comfortable with. And the Fed has to deal with that. Even if the source of those was a supply-driven pandemic dynamic and the Russian invasion, the Fed still has to deal with the consequences of that. And the way they deal with it is to weigh on demand and unfortunately hit labor markets. Hey, Bruce, wonderful to get your thoughts, as always, ahead of CPI and the Fed. Bruce Kasman there of JP Morgan. Lisa, you mentioned the reopening in China. COVID's ripping through that country right now. We yeah. put a story out this morning. The currency volumes have been falling in China 
Brammer was traders call in sick. Yeah, well, this is exactly what Bruce is talking about. They might try to reopen, but can't. They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the jabs and the arms, and that's what we're seeing with the numbers climbing, mm -hmm. even as they move away pretty dramatically. I mean, it's shocking how quickly they have wholesale dropped a lot of the requirements <clears throat> that people had gotten used to for a while. I know you saw the fund manager survey yes. from BFA. Just expectations around global growth, just improving just a little bit off the back of this China story. Except you're not seeing it in the commodity trading. We've been talking Agreed. about that. So how much is Bruce Kasman's view really what's driving at the action? People saying you could try to be open, but you just don't have the, uh, the infrastructure in place just yet. Maybe, though, it is a story for 2023. Dollar CMY right now, about 6.98. We'll pick up on that story a little bit later. If you're just tuning in on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio, the headline crossed the Bloomberg terminal about 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago, from the SEC charging Samuel Bankman-Fried with defrauding investors. And Tom, some pretty bruising quotes oh, yeah. in this statement. Yes. FTX operated behind a veneer of legitimacy. <laughs> Mr. Bankman-Fried created by, among other things, touting its best-in-class controls, including a proprietary risk engine and FTX's adherence to specific investor protection principles and detailed terms <clears> of <throat> services. But as we allege in our complaint, that veneer wasn't just thin. It was fraudulent. There's a history here, and they do cite 33, you know, sort of the advent of the Securities Exchange Commission out of the first debacle of the Depression. And this goes to what we've seen from, say, Harvey Pitt or Arthur Levitt, a Bloomberg LP board member for the years. When the SEC speaks, there's a certain tone different than courts, different than prosecutors. It's very line by line, and this press release has that line by line feel to it. At least picking up on that time this morning, that's for sure. Yeah, and trying to send a message, that's very clear, uh, to a broader <clears throat> industry that potentially there are other I risks. Agree. FTX's collapse highlights the very real risks that unregistered crypto asset trading platforms can pose for investors and customers alike. How broad yeah. is this? How many individuals? What type? Bitcoin, flat, 17,400 off this news. I'll be honest, I would not have expected that. Lisa mentioned the same thing a little mm -hmm. bit earlier this morning. But there is a distinction to be made here, right? Is there not? That this is a failed platform versus something else that Lisa, yeah. a lot of people still have a ton of faith in. That's the question though, right? Because if people start withdrawing their money, how much is this people just hiding out in the best case scenario, but how much does this broadly diminish the investor interest in the crypto You got space? three groups, Nora Rubini sitting here. It's <laughs> not accurate. You got another group that's taking the Kool-Aid and John, you mentioned the group in the middle looking at troubled platforms, but a legitimate coin or token it's a it's a currency key on the bloomberg what's that about that's the conversation we're going to have for a long long time i suspect equity <clears throat> futures right now positive by half of one percent on the s p 500 it is cpi tuesday your data 8 30 eastern time Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The disgraced co-founder of crypto exchange FTX, now in custody in the Bahamas. Sam Bankman-Fried was arrested after the U.S. government filed criminal charges. He'll now await extradition. FTX declared bankruptcy last month after it ran out of cash. There's speculation that client funds were misused before the firm's collapse. The Securities and Exchange Commission filed separate charges against Bankman Fried, saying that he defrauded investors of $1.8 billion. In Ukraine, President Vladimir Zelensky warns that a lull in Russian attacks won't last. He says the break in aerial strikes is a likely a sign that Moscow is preparing another wave of attacks. Zelensky also suggested Russia start withdrawing troops from Ukraine around Christmas as a good faith gesture. Hong Kong is scrapping some of its last remaining COVID restrictions. That follows China's rapid shift away from its zero tolerance approach. The government will lift a ban on international arrivals going to bars or restaurants. It will also stop requiring people to scan a QR code on their phones to enter venues. COVID curbs have hobbled Hong Kong's economy. The White House calls attacks by Twitter owner Elon Musk on top medical advisor Anthony Fauci disgusting. A White House spokeswoman also said Musk's suites are dangerous. Over the weekend, Musk mocked the, use, mocked the use of gender pronouns and called for legal action against Fauci, tweeting, my pronouns are prosecute Fauci. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
There's a lot of minefields to kind of navigate in the first half. It's certainly pointing towards an economic contraction. And therefore, that is really, I think, the overhang on the market right now. We're, we're worried less about supply and more about dwindling demand uh, for the new year. It is the conversation going into 2023. That was Stephen Shork there, the principal at the Shork Group. Let's check out the markets for you. Inflation data in America coming out a little bit later this morning. Equities up by a half of 1%. Marco, Marco, Marco Kalanovic over at JP Now Morgan. what? I underweight. Understood. We shift our equity allocation to uh, a moderate underweight. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. From overweight. Mm. We trim risk in commodities that maintain a sizable overweight and fund these by increasing our allocation to corporate bonds, Tom, and cash. Kalanovic, yesterday. What do you make of that? Right at the end of the year, <laughs> after, after all the losses and after being overweight oh, through much of careful here, John. 22. Me, Speak John. your mind, Tom. Speak your mind. I, I, you know, we have a great humility here, folks, for people that nail it. I think Mr. Wilson this year and others. Great year. And people that maybe miss it on the x-axis, but they stay where they are and they say, out there somewhere, we still see our framework. I'm going to pick this morning on the wonderful John Stolfus at Oppenheimer and company who's been bullish and has stayed that way and is you know, looking pretty good here after what we've seen. And then you've got these people, you know, Mr. Kalanovic could be right. He could be correct here. But uh, it is an odd swing and a late swing, to say the least. Our view is that market and economic weakness may occur in 23 as a result of central bank <coughs> over-tightening with Europe first and the U.S. to follow later next year. The issue that many people have is that the view of many other people is they've been grappling with that story, Tom, for the last nine months. I, I, I'm going to, with great respect to these strategists, it's always brutal. And this year, everyone to a person says, like Lord Kelsey tremendously difficult. Tremendously difficult. But what I like is when they're clear, and to Mr. Kovani, which is um, credit, he's been very clear in the last number of weeks as he ebbs away from, is it safe that I should call him a previous Uber bull? I think, I think you can call him I that. Could, Just look at the forecast Uber. to start the year. Maybe he's a lift bull. But I'll talk about that later this week. Just the forecast to start the year, four year yeah. end, um, radically Do we have any now. news on uh, uh, the current uh, uh, Bankman Fried and all in the last 10 minutes? I don't think we do. Not right now. I think everyone yeah. publishing. Yeah. Mike Allen over at Axios <clears throat> published just moments ago, Tom, and it's the opening line for the ages that we'll have to wait. The testimony that we thought we were yeah. going to get at 10 a.m. a little bit earlier, yeah. a little bit later this morning, I would like to start yeah. by formally stating under oath, I effed <clears> up. <throat> is yeah. what he was planning to say. I think that's appropriate for radio. We'll go with it this morning uh, as, as well. We're going to continue to follow the story again. Shanali Bassick and Amory Horton in uh, Washington. We have inflation here in two hours, and part of inflation has been your gallon of gas and for business diesel. Amrita Sen has been of huge value to Bloomberg Surveillance and Bloomberg Worldwide and joins us now from Energy Aspects. Uh, Amrita, is oil disinflating or is it becoming a true deflationary item within the reports at 8.30? I mean, look, in the near term, it's obviously been uh, deflationary, right? We've seen oil prices collapse, but I will say this has got very little to do with fundamentals. Yes, there were good fundamental reasons why, you know, we were expecting a rally into year and that didn't materialize given the new Chinese lockdowns, French strikes, all of those factors, right? Sure, we should have probably been in the low 90s, late 80s, but not collapsing down to where we have. I'm talking about Brent <clears> here, of course. Um, this has been a massive year-end liquidation event. Lots and lots of funds have liquidated. Uh, and I think that's what's dragged prices here. And that's obviously been de deflationary, at least in the near term. I just don't think this is going to last. Well, it's not going to last, but when's it going to go? And what will make it go? Is it a sense of Pacific Rim demand? Is it global demand? Or is it some supply adjustment? I think it's going to be demand. And I think it's going to be Asia, uh, China in particular, that's going to be the biggest driver of oil markets next year. They are finally giving very clear indications of reopening. So far, you know, we've been very cautious and we've been kind of expecting April onwards but yesterday we put out a note, we raised our Chinese demand numbers because these are the very first mm. concrete they have taken. And I think that is meaningful. Again, it doesn't mean overnight China can reopen. It will be a slow, gradual reopening. But imagine, Tom, it's been three years come February that China would have had COVID. We've seen the kind of pent-up demand in the West when the West opened up. And you're talking about billions, 
1 billion uh, plus people, uh, the pent up demand is going to be huge. And you'd appreciate this is the multiplier effect. The impact it's going to have on the rest of the region, Korean exports, Thailand's tourism, mm. everywhere. I think that's where the big demand push is going to come from. So why is that not being priced into markets at all? Why is nobody following through on the story that everyone seemed to be on board with not so long ago that a reopening in China would be bullish for oil prices? I think these are two things. For me, one, I have a feeling this is a we need to see it to believe it because we've had a couple of quote unquote false starts, right? Even earlier this year, people after Shanghai were expecting loosening of restrictions that didn't quite materialize. Um, and they are still not buying crude in the market the way they used to. That's because they bought a lot of crude in November. They need to run that down. So I think both of that, those things need to coincide. And more generally, it's year end, right? If people have squared off their books, they're not going to necessarily put on positions now. Having said that, if you look at the curve, if you look at the price set right now uh, for 2023, it does look extremely attractive. You don't need major supply losses to tighten this market up. Just the end of the SPR and China reopening. Uh, does provide some huge, huge bull cases uh, for next year. Yeah, I was going to say the uh, Strategic Petroleum Reserve releases are still ongoing, the last one having uh, just been finished with respect to the distribution. How much has that influenced the price? Hugely. If you take a step back this year, what has actually happened is that we haven't lost much oil at all from the Russian invasion, right? Because the embargo has just only kicked in. Uh, since the invasion, we have had 270 million barrels of global SPR released and maybe half a million barrels of, day of Russian losses. So you can do the numbers. And yet, commercial inventories, yes, we've built, but only built by about 150 million barrels. So had it not been for the strategic petroleum reserves, we would have run out of oil in several places. And really sad of energy aspects. Not the year end to crude, I think many people were looking for. Yeah. Great to catch up, I'm as really always. Sorry. If you are just tuning in on TV and radio, this morning has changed. At 10 a.m. Eastern time, we were expecting testimony from Sam Bankman Free to the House Financial Services Committee, led by Maxine Waters. And then in the last hour, this headline from the SEC Bankman Free, Tom charged with defrauding investors. Yeah, and the charge of defrauding investors doesn't capture it, John. You were great about reading out the testimony. I went to one item on tokens as well, but I just think charge doesn't, you know, I've seen charges from the SEC and they're never fun. I mean, these are, you know, civil criminal issues, but this is line by line going after him. I mean, there, there's no padding in this statement. Lisa, you're better at this than I think many. The defense <clears throat> of this individual what did you make of the media tour? Is there a suggestion within the media tour of the last month of the line of defense that he's trying to take? Incompetence. Just being clumsy. Naive. Naive. We didn't know. Exactly. I messed up. My intention is to make everyone whole. I am so sorry. I feel <clears throat> like I've failed. It's my misdoing. I didn't necessarily uh, have any engagement with Alameda. If you look at the statement that he prepared for the congressional testimony, he says, I was no longer in charge of Alameda, the personal trading arm that the SEC accuses as being his private crypto hedge fund. He was saying he had no knowledge of what was going on there. So this is partly a plea of ignorance and incompetence. But, well, I, I'm going to take real stick. issues here. This guy's physics mathematics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This ignorance thing drives me mental. Just drives me absolutely nuts. This kid was a sterling high school student in 20 math. I don't think that's a character assessment of Lisa. <laughs> I'm just saying. I think that's no, just I'm not talking about yeah. Lisa. That's the I'm talking about I'm sick taking. and tired of the media telling us, woe is me. This guy is so dumb. So, come on, he's no, physics I, math. I think we're from all on MIT. the same page, Tom. Lisa, we're oh, all of course on the same we're on the page same. on that. We're getting, we're getting accolades worldwide. You know the pinata I've been for my feeling on BitDog? Well, but Bit Bitcoin has been holding in. There is a question oh, and a distinction. Oh, come on, 69,000 to 17,000? But there 000? is a distinction right now. And the, the line is important to draw. We don't know how thin that line is. Oh, we I are going to find Argentina, out. Croatia. What we're going to find me. out is what we, over the next couple of months, who else is going to be indicted here? Who else is going to be drawn sure. into this web? How broadly within the crypto sphere, or is okay. this the bad actors? When you speak with crypto in, um, people in the industry, they say, we welcome this. We want to weed out the bad actors so that we can get back to what we do. Whether that story sticks what is do what they we're going to see. What do they do? I'm asking for Nora Rabini. Who's, Again, the, I've been who's, going who's they? The industry. What do they do besides promise people? There's, there's a banner at the World Cup. 
Crypto.com, on their website, they promise you, John, 8%. I think they're going to struggle to attract the capital that they've been attracting over the last several years. 8%. You to Lisa's can... point, he spent the last month talking about being clumsy, naive. Oh. The SEC this morning saying it was systematic, suggesting it was deliberate, and accusing Bankman Freed of defrauding investors. More still to come from New York. This is Bloomberg. <clears throat> I think 2023 is opening the door for a recession. We're expecting either slow growth or a mild recession. There's a lot more signs now of a pretty clear inflection point in both the growth and the inflation numbers. What we've had is the flop. We're still kind of waiting for the chop. You've got to concentrate on, you know, I, I think surviving the difficult <coughs> start to next year. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. What a 24 hours. CPI, 90 minutes away. Inflation data in America. CPI Tomorrow, Tuesday. the Fed decides. And Tom, this morning already, the SEC charging Samuel Bankman Free <clears throat> with defrauding investors. Talk about the news flow this morning. News flow is extraordinary. We're going to bring it all to you getting into the Fed meeting uh, tomorrow. You wonder if this comes up with, frankly, with Chairman Powell in the press conference tomorrow as well. John, I really don't know where to start. We've got Julian Emanuel on equity markets. going to be great at right now, but I think we've got to go to this breaking news and note that Bitcoin is removed from these headlines. It has not moved. So we're going to break things up, Tom. In about 10 minutes' time, we'll catch up with Shanali Basak down in Washington, yeah. D.C., alongside Bloomberg's Anne-Marie to get the latest, because Lisa... <clears throat> there is still a hearing set to take place at 10 a.m. Eastern time. I think the tone of that hearing has changed somewhat. Uh, perhaps just a little bit. His prepared testimony was going to plead ignorance and incompetence and talk about the timeline as greatest hits of how he dealt with the whole situation. Perhaps the tone has changed now that he is in custody in the Bahamas, going to be extradited to the United States. We will also get later this morning that uh, indictment unsealed from the Southern District of New York federal prosecutors to get more detail of the criminal charges on that side. I think a lot of people asking, Lisa, what took so long? what took so long. My question this morning is, why now? Why yesterday evening? Why this morning? Why hours before we were set to hear from him? On Capitol Hill? It's a great question. I'm not going to pretend to have an answer. We don't know what the coincident, uh, could a coincident factor is. There was an issue with how he was going to get back to the United States. Was he going to be taken into custody if he came from the Bahamas on his own volition to the United States? I do wonder if that expedited some of the proceedings <laughs> on the criminal side simply because of the logistics of coming to the U.S. for those hearings. Uh, possibly. The quote of the morning, Tom, from the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, you picked up on it almost immediately. We allege that Sam Bankman fried build a house of cards. Yeah, the house of cards is there with all the allusions to Hollywood and that. But then I go down and say they make careful note of the validity of tokens. I'm not going to opine on that. I'm not qualified to opine on that. I would lean on who Mr. Gensler is leaning on, which is the Bank of International Settlements in Geneva. And Raphael Auer has put together a body of literature over the last four years and part of the heart of that, mining all this idiot thermodynamic electric stuff, his recent one on retail, but also, John, looking at the token validity. A house of cards on a foundation of deception. More coverage still to come. Let's get straight into the price action. We're 90 minutes away from inflation data in America, <clears throat> going into all of that. Equities have been rallying. They were rallying yesterday. Biggest one-day pop we've seen on the month so far. A lift again today, up by a half of 1% this morning on the S&P. Futures elevated again this morning. Yields just a little bit lower by a couple of basis points. Tom, 358.54. And euro <clears throat> dollar... I have to say, euro dollar not doing much. One hundred five thirty four. Yeah, I mean the data's there, and it's it's you know it's 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 moving and in that and oils it got its own story. I thought Amrita said it was great. I really don't know where to look on the data this morning, John. Off of CPI, other than equities gave us a little bit of a tick of that at about two p.m. Do you want the cheat guide for equities? I was going through the numbers yesterday, September twenty one. <clears throat> We opened up at 37.89. That was Fed meeting day, November 2nd, Fed decision day. We opened that day at 38.52. We closed yesterday at 39.90. Lisa Bramitz, this equity market has hardly done a thing since September. Just a lot of chop in between. Perhaps the index level. Underneath the index level, there's been a re-rating of very specific sectors and companies, and that has been a massive shift. We'll get a better sense of which areas of the economy are continuing to chug along here with the 8.30 a.m. print. The CPI, the headline number is expected to come down to 7.3 percent from 7.7 percent. J.P. Morgan saying a softer than expected read, extreme softer than expected read of 6.9 percent could trigger a 10 percent rally 
in equities. Again, which side is that going to be driven by? Is that big tech that's going to su suddenly get a boost from this idea of massive disinflation or something of that nature? We're going to be looking at services sector inflation very carefully. Today, we're also going to be perhaps reading that indictment that's going to be unsealed by the Southern District of New York. Federal prosecutors coming out. Sam Bankman Freed currently in custody in the Bahamas as uh, the U.S. House of Representatives <coughs> prepares for a hearing that had expected his attendance, his prepared testimony, perhaps creating the contours of his side. Now we deal with the politicians and how they uh, d deal with this and try to discuss perhaps some of the donations that he made to a number of of different campaigns. And at 1 p.m., $18 billion of 30 notes being auctioned off, John. I do think it's interesting considering the failed auction yesterday. Not yes, failed, it was messy. but really messy auction. It was messy. It was a soft one, but I think understandable. And I think you'd agree. Going into CPI this morning, going into the Fed tomorrow. We get lucky this morning. Joining us around the table, yes. Julian Emanuel, the chief equity strategist at Evercore ISI. Julian, good morning. Good morning. We haven't had the cathartic <clears throat> moment, according to you, that the low earlier on this year is a low, not the low of this bear market. Why? Uh, look, if you look at past bear markets, there is always that moment. And even in the sort of strange ones, like the fourth quarter of, of 2018, when we were in that, you know, three-month degrossing bear market, you still had a cathartic moment where people just said, get me out. Um, and essentially, that kind of selling pressure really creates the buying opportunity. And for us, when you look at 2022, yes, volatility has remained elevated. And we have strangeness going on this week with the VIX climbing as the market has climbed. Uh, but you have not had that moment of pan There really right. has been very little emotion in this moment. Two questions. What's the VIX level you need to see? It's not 40, is it? Uh, it, it ultimately will be. Okay, okay. cool. It, it, okay. I, everybody wants to know, when you're sitting at that little table that, that Ed Hyman's got with a black pen, how you link the Emanuel world into the Ed Hyman world. You do it in your note as Ed alludes back to the 70s, the 40s, and the 30s. How is this inflation and this moment into next year allude back to those troubled times? So uh, it, it, Ed is very clear on this, and, and we, we certainly agree wholeheartedly this is not the 1970s. The metastasizing effect of inflation uh, Ed, that we had for an entire decade is not there. Uh, you know, clearly we've had these problems. However, we're on the other side of it. We're seeing these readings start to come in. Uh, but the other aspect of it, thinking about the 1930s and the 1940s, and actually 1970 itself, is this decline in, in money supply, M2 going negative. That's a risk that the Fed uh, might have to step back and reassess yeah, just how fast it's high. Do you understand that? So, C.J. Lawrence, I mean, you're taking Ed back to C.J. Lawrence when we go M2, M3, M this. Well, it, it's look I, that I, Thursday I, afternoon release of the money supply was uh, world stopped. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. What's going to lead the equity indexes lower at this point, given that uh, big tech has already sold off disproportionately? Uh, we think that story has more to be written. If you look at it, value versus growth, the extremes are certainly less extreme after the year that we've had of growth underperformance. But there is still uh, really a, an embedded passion for, let's say, FANG uh, amongst the part of the public whose uh, equity holdings remain near all-time highs as a percentage of household net worth. And we think that is going to be worked off in, in certainly the first uh, six months or so. Can we talk about consensus just briefly? You published a little bit later in the year. You waited. You waited. You published. And it sounds a lot like what we've heard already, which is next year dip and then we rip <laughs> and we end the year at 4150. That's the call from Evercore. Julian, how do you feel when everyone's saying the same thing about the year ahead? Very uncomfortable. Very, very uh, sure. no bones about it. And, and I will say that the most bullish thing about the setup right now is the fact that my uh, competition on the strategy side, the average price target is 4,000. Okay. And, you know, <clears throat> I, I am not a raging bull by having a well, 41 When was the last time we were forecasting a flat market year-end? I, I, I don't remember it. I, I don't know that there's any precedent for it whatsoever. Uh, and that, uh, along with the fact that this recession is the most anticipated uh, recession of our entire lifetimes, really gives you pause for the potential for upside here. So where could the consensus and you be wrong? If the recession doesn't come. OK, we, we all know what's happening. We all know what the components of it are. But again, think about it. 
Would we have ever thought that we would have seen two negative quarters of GDP like we saw in the beginning of this year and that not be labeled a recession for the first time since the 1940s? If somehow we skate on through, you know, zero growth, slightly below zero, Ed's forecast is zero percent GDP, that implies a mild recession. But if it doesn't happen, there is, you know, upside in our view to 4,600. Do you remember when you were charged with talking about Bitcoin? Do you remember the good old days? Uh, I do. And, and basically, from our point of view in, in thinking about crypto is, and we talked about this constantly, is that... Are you, are you the, interviewing him? <laughs> <laughs> I'm taping it for Ed. Continue. Is, is that there's an aspect of the technology, the, the blockchain, most people would agree that there's validity to, te to the technology, the same way there was validity to the transcontinental railroad system in the 1870s, but yet the entire industry went bankrupt during the decade of the 1870s before uh, for further economic development. Julian, it's a space that attracted a lot of capital and a lot of coverage. You covered it at your own shop, and I just wonder for... Let's use Evercore as, as an example. How difficult would it be to convince Hyman now that this is something we should cover at the firm? Well, look, and it, isn't that kind of the point right now that this is going to be kind of hands off for the doubters for a long, long time still to come? Uh, there is no question about the fact. And then again, if, if you think about the price action, the price action is telling you something. The fact that since this scandal was uncovered, <coughs> the price of Bitcoin really hasn't moved materially lower after the initial, uh, uh, you know, uh, tribulations. It tells you that there is a fundamental belief in the technology, but yet, as is typical for most markets, once there's that sort of feeling of disgust, you're going to have a year, two years, three years, maybe more, of just sideways price action to where only the true believers remain in the industry, and then likely you have your next bout of progress. Tom, you were talking about exactly that. I, I, I'm I, I go with the railroad analogy, but I can't go there. I think this is something else. And I go back to Ken Rogoff in his most courageous book I've ever seen of the generation, The Curse of Cash. This is about non-regulation. It's like Binance, far more international than FTX. I'm speaking as an amateur there. Don't quote me. And the idea of this, not that it was a scam, but it was wrapped around unregulated activity from day one and this morning, John, to regulators. The adults showed up this morning. Well, the headline at about 7 and the adults, the SEC, charging Bankman Freed with defrauding investors. <clears throat> Julian, this was great. Looking Julian, thank you. Thank you. Julian, can we just do this on a monthly basis, yeah. maybe even, you know, every two yeah. weeks? Just come into the studio and Who hang out for now. Drag it, I'm in along. I'll, I'll sit out. You can, you know. Talk. We'll get Gensler to come. <laughs> yeah. Have a we'll Have a broader conversation. <laughs> Victoria Fernandez is coming up shortly in the next hour. We get CPI, inflation data in America, in one hour and 18 minutes. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. U.S. regulators are adding to the problems facing disgraced FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried. The Securities and Exchange Commission accuses Bankman-Fried of carrying out a multi-year scheme to defraud investors. He's also accused of concealing risks and using commingled consumer customer funds. Bankman-Fried was arrested Monday in the Bahamas on separate U.S. criminal charges. Disgraced FCF co-founder Bankman Reed under fire on two fronts today. As we just said, he was arrested in the Bahamas Monday after prosecutors filed charges against him. Moving on, investors are waiting U.S. inflation data that could shape the outlook for Fed interest rate hikes into next year. The Consumer Price Index out at 8.30 New York time. A subdued CPI number, well, that would justify the Federal Reserve's projected half-point interest rate hike on Wednesday. And Bloomberg's learned that China is delaying a closely watched economic policy meeting this week. That's because of a surge in COVID infections in Beijing. No word when the meeting will be rescheduled. China has warned it faces a big jump in the number of COVID cases after scrapping most testing and isolation of infected patients. In the UK, the government is warning of significant disruption in the National Health Service. Both nurses and ambulance drivers are preparing to go on strike in the run up to Christmas. Some 600 members of Britain's armed services are being trained to drive ambulances. Public sector workers are demanding pay hikes that keep pace with inflation. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
the reason the Fed is so focused on continuing to raise rates, not necessarily at the supersized 75 basis point increase that we saw earlier, but 50 basis points, and as you said, more work to come down the road, is because inflation is still elevated. That was Lindsay Piexa, the Stiefel chief economist. I did not expect the Fed decision tomorrow to be buried in the news flow in quite the way it is this morning. But it is. We are one hour and about 12 minutes away, 13 minutes away from inflation data in America. As we go into that, equity futures shaping up as follows, up about a half of 1% on the S&P 500. Yields come in a couple of basis points on a 10-year 358. Lisa mentioned it a few times this morning. Messy auction yesterday on the 10-year ahead of CPI this morning and the Federal Reserve tomorrow. Euro dollar not doing much, 105.39 and crude at 73.36. The main event this morning... Less than 24 hours before, he was expected to testify before the House Financial Services Committee. Disgraced FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried arrested in the Bahamas. Awaiting details of the charges from the federal indictment in New York, but just over an hour ago, the SEC announced its charges against Bankman-Fried, writing in a statement, FTX operated behind a veneer of legitimacy. Mr. Bankman-Fried created by, among other things, touting its best-in-class controls, including a proprietary risk engine and FTX's adherence to specific investor protection principles and detailed terms of service. But as we allege in our complaint, Tom, that veneer wasn't just thin. <clears throat> TK, it was fraudulent. And it goes on. That's just the meat of it. That's a perfect quote to quote, John. But this is line by line. Their, I guess, ground they will stand on as they move forward. And Lisa, you're better maybe than this. And that how do they link into the court system that's also looking at these kind of events separately? How do the two dovetail? It's, well, it's a mystery clear, to me. It's clear that the investigations were related and depended somewhat on each other. They do go through different court systems. We're not only going to get the SDNY, Southern District of New York, coming out with their indictment today, uh, unveiling that. That's the expectation. But also the CFTC, Tom, is expected to also yeah. go after him. Again, the tentacles of this <clears throat> are really some of the biggest questions that people are looking for. We're scrupulous about it when we're wrong. John's surveillance correction. I mentioned earlier a sponsor of the World Cup, which we've been shockingly devoid of today. And I said weeks ago they had 8% you could make doing whatever these things do. That's not there anymore. And what's there is you can get up to 5% back on the Crypto.com Visa card. Oh, is that what it says? they get up to 3% rewards on your Bitcoin and many others. Still out there, isn't it? There's, they're amending it as they can. We need to get an update on this in the last hour. Shanali Basak in Washington with Anne Marie Horton. Shanali, what have you learned in the last 60 minutes? What is the distinction in your study of these documents? I think importantly, we had the FTX CEO who's testifying today in front of the House saying that FTX had commingled funds. And in that SEC complaint, you also see them really talking about the commingled FTX customer funds used for undisclosed venture investments, lavish real estate purchases, and large political donations. We'll talk more about those political donations. But I've got to also mention this venture investment portion of this. Remember, we talk a lot about how venture investors had ignored the red flags as they invested into FTX. The SEC now saying that those investors were misled. But remember, people who took the money from Sam Bankman-Fried as well as FTX Ventures also, we have heard later many anecdotes of folks that have said that they thought they were taking money from FTX, and they got a term sheet that said that Alameda was investing at the end of the day. So there were red flags uh, little by little over time. And now it's a big question of uh, how people <coughs> invest, but also who people take money from as they look well, to grow their business. Emory Horton, the senator from New York, uh, uh, Gillenbrand, uh, I guess got money from Mr. Bankman Fried, and she's going to give it back. Is that what we're going to hear today? Are we just going to have a lineup of people? Granted, maybe there's dumb as I was and they didn't see this coming and they're all going to say they're going to give the money back or they're going to donate it to John Farrell, one of the two. Tom, it's already been happening. You've seen a number of lawmakers that have taken money from San Bankman Freed since really the collapse of this in early November, donating that money back to a number of charitable organizations, whether it be $2,000, $12,000. They want to make sure that they are saying that their hands are clean. They didn't realize that this was allegedly or potentially fraudulent um, scheme going on and that they want to give that money back. Now, Shanali and I, welcome to D.C., Shanali, have been talking about actually the other side of this as well. His deputy, the number two, 
Nick Salem. While we talk about Sam Bankman Fried and the millions he's given to Democrats, his number two was giving a ton of money, almost as much as him, but to the other side, to Republicans. So also, you're going to have Republicans come out that took from his number two, who's not getting really all the headline names right now, also probably be giving that money back. But altogether, in the 2022 election cycle, these two individuals gave more than $60 million. Anne-Marie, there's a larger question beyond just the political donations about whether the touch has been perhaps overly light when it comes to this space, overly friendly, whether it's political donations or whether it's to not stifle innovation in the face of a lot of money sloshing around the system. How much criticism are Congress members coming under for a lack of a harsh approach to some of these players? Well, they probably will come under a lot more when we get more of this news out, and especially looking through this SEC statement, which obviously calls what he was doing a, quote, house of cards. There's going to be a lot of these grenades thrown at politicians about why they would didn't step up uh, in place. Although we should note, there has been talk on the Hill throughout the summer in September uh, about a cryptocurrency regulation legislation. The issue that this legislation has is that many believe that potentially it would have been at least a little bit more welcoming to the crypto industry than some of the hardliners in the crypto industry would like to see. It would have given the CFTC a lot more oversight, and some say actually this should come under the purview of the SEC. But what was going to happen now is legislation is going to have to move, I imagine, because there's going to be a ton of questions, and people are going to say that lawmakers need to get a handle on it. Chanelle, just quickly here, in the broader venture capital and the broader investment space, it's surprising to me that crypto assets, crypto uh, currencies are not selling off in response to this news. I'm even looking at a number of brokerages, crypto brokerages, their shares are all up if you look at the pre-market moves. Is there a feeling that the contagion has already happened or is there still another shoe to drop? I think Tom Keen is absolutely right here. You have to keep an eye on Binance here, a company here that has seen $3.7 billion of outflows here, net outflows in the past week. Uh, keep an eye on it. But to the point here, the reason people flock to Bitcoin so much is that idea of decentralization. But remember, not your keys, not your coins. So uh, the on-ramps to this industry are going to increasingly matter here. And remember, aside from what's happening with these criminal charges that Sam Bankman fried is facing, there are a host of bankruptcies. Like, let's be honest here. In the background, you have hordes of companies that have hired Wall Street bankers and white shoe law firms to run around Wall Street to raise money as they look to get passed through this crypto winter. Shinali, this thank you. Crypto winter. I think that's what it is, right? She's writing the screenplay. Arctic. <laughs> She's winter writing the screenplay. You reckon? Shinali Vasek, Anne Marie, down in DC. So there is a hearing still to take place today, right? At 10 a.m. The House Financial Cement Services Committee. I think you've, you've been hearing. ahead of me on this, John. You, you've nailed saying. this thing. Well, what's, the attention that we What's interesting see. is that we're still here from the new CEO. At least we expect to. And based on our reporting in the last 24 <clears throat> hours, last week, prosecutors, the FBI, Department of Justice officials, and FTX's new CEO and restructuring expert Ray met at SDNY's headquarters in downtown Manhattan. So I think it would be maybe a little premature to throw freezing cold water over this hearing. I think this hearing at 10 a.m. could still be interesting, Lisa. And the current CEO has not been talking to Sam Bankman Fried, and Sam Bankman Fried complained about that, said, I've been emails. trying to, yeah, looking at, hey, mm. I can provide you with some information. And he complained about that in the, uh, in the, the statement that he prepared for yeah. Congress. Whether we get perhaps something substantive, what's going to be the nature of it? Is it going to be a broader web or is it going to be a full disclosure, a full mea culpa of the current CEO of what happened? Do you want Tweet of the Morning? Please. Just to change the subject. So United have announced an order of up to 200 new Boeing airplanes, 787 Dreamliners. I know you've seen this, Tom. Connor Sen of Bloomberg Opinion, quote, weird. They violated the business rule that you can't make massive wide body plane orders when the ISM is below 50 and the <laughs> yield curve is inverted. Isn't that great? Yeah. Lufthansa with positives as well. Connor sent out on Twitter this morning. <clears throat> Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. The latest inflation data in America due 60 minutes from now. Before we get there, here's a taste of flavor of the equity market for you. Biggest one-day pop on the S&P 500 yesterday. Off the month so far, a lift to this equity market again this morning. Up a half of 1% on the S&P, both on that and on the Nasdaq 100. 
as well. Looking at the bond market, twos, tens and thirties, deep, deep, deep curve inversion over the last few months. A bit more. Depth to that, Tom. We're down three basis points on a 10-year, 357.99 on a two-year unchanged at 437. I'm glad you bring this up, John, because I've missed it. What is the distinction of the bond market dynamics and shifts right now into inflation, into the Fed? I I, I, I can't see it. I keep hearing that bonds are back, Tom, that bonds are back going into 2023. Yep, I keep hearing the same thing. I'm asking the question, though, how much of the risk reward is shifted over the last month though we've had what have we had an 80 basis point move on a 10 year off the highs of the year of about 430 back down to about 350 on a two year a couple of fridays ago several fridays ago now it was about a month or so ago we had a two year get really close to 480 and at least we're back down to about 437 and a lot of people are saying that perhaps uh, people have gotten a little bit overexcited about the Fed pause kind of uh, storyline. I do think today is going to be really important. In 60 Minutes times, we're, not, we're perhaps going to be talking less about Sam Bankman-Fried and a little bit more about inflation in America. The conversation is going to shift markedly, and then it's on to tomorrow. So tomorrow, most people are anticipating a 50 basis point hike from this Federal Reserve. Then after that, Lisa, really it's going to come down to the projections that you get. They call it the SCP, the Summary of Economic Projections, the dot plot nice. and all the forecasts nice. for next year. I keep hearing 525. I went through all the bank's <clears throat> research, 5 to 525. I think that was Goldman, it was Citi, Bank of America. Now, if everyone's expecting the dot plot to shift up to 5 to 525, question I've been asking over the last week or so, where's the scope for the hawkish surprise? Is it the well, communication in the news conference? Because if it's the dot plot, I'm asking a question while you're all expecting this shift to a five handle, how do they surprise? Especially since a lot of people are projecting it probably will only go up to a 4.9% yeah. uh, statistic. Can I frame the outlier here quickly? Please Dominic Constum, super restrictive is the language he uses, and Ben Emmons published a brilliant note this morning using the phrase ultra-restrictive. That's the risk they have going into this. It's 5% super restrictive. And that's the They're conversation They're suggesting we'll have. it is because of this unique economy. That's a, it's a minority view, let's be clear on and that. And clearly, if CPI fades quickly, Lisa, <clears throat> it's going to look restrictive quite quickly. Well, in 60 minutes' time, we will be talking all about that. Right now, we're still focused on the Sam Bankman-Fried storyline. And what I've been struck by is the lack of action that you have seen in uh, crypto-related assets and crypto-related companies. If you take a look at some of the companies that are most hinging typically on the crypto sphere, they are all positive in pre-market trading. You have MicroStrategy up 2%, Marathon Digital up nearly 2% as well, and Coinbase up <clears> nearly 1%. The losses year to date have been dramatic for these companies, ranging from 60 to 80% declines. So we've already gotten that baked in, but it raises this question of have we seen the worst of it? Have we basically already seen the contagion? John, I, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that given how much money went into the space and given uh, the fact that some of the bigger players are getting perhaps un, uh, unleashed as or, uh, you know, basically shown to be perhaps acting in somewhat of a fraudulent manner. I, I mentioned it a little bit earlier this morning. I think it's worth mentioning again. So many people are saying the same thing anyway. This is an area that attracted so much capital investment over the last several years or so. There will be some real career risk attached to making those decisions now. And I won't name names or firms, but I think you've <clears> seen at <throat> certain firms that put money into these kind of ventures, those individuals have now left to make people make those same decisions again, they're going to have to have this extra layer of conviction that maybe is absent right now. And what happened to all the retail traders? Everybody who was talking about getting in and making a quick buck, and what about the institutions that lost oh. hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars? To your point, how much does that really withdraw some of the capital from even the peripheries, yeah. all of the infrastructure well, that built think, around I around think there's a difference in one part. I, I don't think this is like the late 90s where people got burnt by stocks and didn't come back to stocks for a long, long time. Something unique about this asset class where the people who believe in it really, 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 really believe in it. <laughs> no, I'm not and I don't know if that's changed at all, Bramo, over the last several months. Which is the reason why I've been looking at the trading activity and the fact that you're not seeing a wholesale abandonment of the industry speaks to your point that perhaps it doesn't change of anything. If you hear the line from crypto enthusiasts, it's thank you. Let's weed out the bad actors and let's get on with so it. So just to put a bow on it. So we've heard from the SEC. They're charging Bankman Freed with defrauding investors. You've mentioned the Southern District in New York a few times this morning. What are we waiting for from them this morning? To unveil the indictment. And uh, to, to Tom's point earlier, when we were talking, what's the difference between the SEC and SDNY and the Southern District of New York? SEC is only civil. 
SDNY is criminal. So that is guilty or not guilty versus who is Sam Bankman Freed ultimately <clears throat> liable to and for how much? Yeah. We're going to continue this discussion. It's not going to go away this morning here. What, John, 55 minutes away from a hugely acclaimed inflation report. We'll, of course, give you full coverage on that. But right now we look at the litmus paper of the system, and it's not Bitcoin. It's the dollar. Mark McCormick joins us, global head of FX strategy at TD Securities. Mark, you nailed strong and resilient dollar. We had HSBC on Daryl Meyer the other day, and he said the same thing. Have you gone to a weak dollar strategy or a lesser resilient dollar? Yeah, I think in terms of tr tactically trading, the convictions are a little bit lower on stronger dollar. I think uh, if you think about it this way, we have to think about how do we trade ideas and basically how we forecast them. So our premise is that we're still very bearish on the dollar on a forecasting profile. If we look into the second half of 2023 or even where we are at this point next year, uh, we're bearish the dollar. I think going into 2023, though, we are actually bullish the dollar. We have a generally pretty high conviction on it. As you mentioned, it revolves around inflation, it revolves around Fed, it revolves around China reopening and the global economy in general. And I think what we've seen the last, uh, mm. say, six weeks or so is the, the global tail risks have been reduced, but we have not seen an acceleration in the global economy and the reduction mm. in the risk premiums and uh, you know, basically a very well-populated long dollar position has all just been squeezed mm. out. Uh, but the fundamentals are still very supportive for the dollar, at least as we move into Q1 2023. Is your study a rate analysis, a real rate analysis, a, a nominal, no, or is it a flow analysis in the next year? I'd say it's a factor analysis. Um, that's that's quite critical because it relates to all the things that we've talked about and focused on this year and whether or not those things reverse or whether or not we have momentum. And to me, the key of overarching theme for FX remains commodities and remains the terms of trade shock. And what our models are kind of telling us right now is the terms of trade shock has reversed for Europe. It's reversed for Japan. Those things allow to reduce the pressure of break evens and lower real rates that we saw that was such a dominant driver of the dollar. So it's, it is at, the, at the, the core of it, it's a real rates. But it's driven by external factors the central banks have no control over. And the Fed had just more room to raise nominal rates relative to where uh, inflation expectations were going, being priced in the market. But to me, we have to think about uh, inflation momentum. We have to think about terms of trade. And what we're seeing in FX markets, they are pivoting to value. Valuation models have been awful uh, for at least the last year. And momentum models have done well, which is the first time we've seen FX momentum actually make a ton of money. Uh, in terms of performance. So I think the critical angle here is we're seeing the pivot on the global economy, and that is a value trade for FX, which is very bearish for the dollar if we can muddle through uh, the global scenarios next year. Mark, I have to ask you this because we've been talking all morning about Sam Bankman Freed. And once upon a time, people were talking about Bitcoin as a comparable currency to the dollar and a store of value that would rival all of the major currencies. Based on what we have been seeing, have you moved away from that kind of idea? Do any of your co-strategists still talk about Bitcoin in tandem with some of the G10 currencies? I think, as you mentioned, it's a bit of a hope. And there's a view, and I think, as you mentioned, it's related to stocks and some of the other bubbles we've seen. But I think this is a real disruption. Um, if you kind of read the underpinnings of what a lot of people in crypto like to, to link back to, it's a book that came out in the 90s. It's a sovereign individual. And it's a concept of disruption. It's a concept of uh, you know the digital economy and a, and a pivot away from the industrial age to the information age. And that just requires a new set of technologies, a new set of tools, and new currencies. Uh, so I do kind of think that at the end of this, uh, you know, this is kind of the first try with a new currency and a new structure. And obviously, you've had a lot of bad apples and you've, you've had some failings behind it. But I do think the concept of disruption, uh, especially in the currency space, uh, in the world that we have, which is going to be very digital, is something that I think is still something that will be very important and will be a core alternative. You know, obviously not to the dollar itself, but the technology and disruption, the process is going to be probably very important as we move through the next five to 10 years. How much do you pay attention to that when you look at the dynamics in the broader FX markets that are very liquid and more traditional? Well, the way we look at it, what's interesting is that there, early on, we tried to run Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies through our macro models and the factors and things we just talked about, some of the fundamental stuff that works quite well uh, for some of the fiat currencies. They did, not, they did not explain any of Bitcoin or Ethereum or any cryptocurrencies. But in the last year, year and a half, 
Uh, you are a single factor that explains equities, that explains rates, that explains currencies of the dollar. That factor started to explain half of Bitcoin. So it was very clear that the cost of money was a critical driver in the crypto trade. And so I think part of it is, again, we need real rates to settle. We need the volatility on rate to, on rate moves itself. If you look at the move index, we've seen that peak as well. That's been inviting more people back to emerging markets. But it's very clear right now that you know what crypto was is in, a, in an age of easy money and a very low cost for disruption, the idea behind it worked very well. And now the cost of money going up has forced people to kind of rethink about where there's actual profit, where there's value. And that's why technology itself has been disrupted uh, in the disruption phase. Mark, thank you, sir. As always, Mark McCormick there of TD. I had a CPI a little bit later this morning. The end of easy money, TK. It's <clears throat> ended this year, that's for sure. It's a heart of the matter. and I sound like a broken record on this, but it is a theme for next year. The easy money's gone. Julian Emanuel mentioned it. Maybe it was off camera when he when he did. The risk-free rate's back. A sharp analysis has uh, validity. Maybe profit is back in vogue now. Some say active management's back in vogue because of this. I'm not there. Why aren't I'm, you there on that? Do you think that's just a sales pitch? One of my moments, you know, folks across, how long have I been here? Six, seven years, whatever it is. There was a moment in an event where I had the honor of John Bogle of Vanguard and Cliff Asnes together. And it was magical to talk about this passive active debate. That's a and point Cliff point. was so respectful to Mr. Bogle, so respectful about what John Bogle invented. And here we are. I saw, at least in your world, I saw somewhere in the zeitgeist, ETF bond investments now ginormous compared to anything else. Ginormous is CFA level four. I'm told, yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that, that was the example of how to dodge a question. <laughs> thank you. Very eloquent, though. I do. It's because Bramos here, we're not doing World Cup talk. Is that what it's about? I can talk about it later. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy tomorrow. I'm still unhappy that Chairman Powell is, is going up against the World Cup semi final. But I'm just thinking of talking to management and yeah. maybe. <laughs> Where? In sort DC? Of, no, here. And skipping perhaps that. skipping a Fed. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. Christina Campmany of Invesco coming up next. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Disgraced FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried is under fire on two fronts today. Bankman-Fried was arrested in the Bahamas Monday after U.S. prosecutors filed criminal charges against him. Meanwhile, the Securities and Exchange Commission has filed a civil action lawsuit accusing Bankman-Fried of carrying out a multi-year scheme to defraud investors of $1.8 billion. Members of the European Union will try again to reach a deal on a controversial plan to cap high natural gas prices. The EU Energy Commissioner says the talks may be the most difficult yet. We will uh, at least aim for broad um, agreement on, uh, on technical parameters. And uh, as we all know, um, there are still very different views uh, around the table, so this um, at first, we, we need to see if ministers do have the willingness for compromises. Germany, the Netherlands and Denmark are among those calling for a cautious approach. Belgium, Italy, Greece and Poland are pushing for a more aggressive method to contain gas prices. Hong Kong is scrapping some of its last remaining COVID restrictions. That follows China's rapid shift away from its zero tolerance approach. The government will lift a ban on international arrivals, going to bars or restaurants. It will also stop requiring people to scan a QR code on their phones to enter venues. COVID curbs have hobbled Hong Kong's economy. Global News 24 hours a day on AR on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Getting down to 2%, I think is pretty difficult. I don't think you get there quickly. And I think the Fed will have to look at the data and sacrifice to some degree um, the inflationary side of it going, maybe they get to three or 4%, but I don't think they want to you know, sink the country into a more severe recession. Deborah Cunningham there, a federated um, it's live from New York City. Tom just confirming what my <laughs> Christmas present is. Yeah. Would you say bit dog? Bit dog, it's a primer. Okay. Bit dog, oh, it's, a, it's a book. It's on a book. Bit dog. Yeah, it's 800 nice. pages. You'll love it. Yeah. It's almost as thick as Crescenzi's book on the two year. 
I can't wait for this gift. Are you going to bother wrapping it up or it's just throw it across the desk? Well, because you got the tree you've got, I figure the glow of the tree Pause. will shine down. <laughs> the squirrel will deliver it. He is so unhappy about my tree. <laughs> I know. FaceTimed me, started it's critiquing it. What was un-American about it? Come on, it's you got the kind of tree where you wrap it, you put it in the closet, you go up, you love it, <laughs> <laughs> it comes down. You have to put it I'm together. Sitting there, I'm sitting there at home with ugly lights from the Christmas store changing the bulbs where they've burnt out. You're upset by its perfection. You're offended by it. Yeah, by the no, symmetry. It's a modern statement, and I love that you do that. It's a modern, statement. It's a modern you know, statement. My tree. <laughs> there's yeah. a squirrel. I'll send you a photo. There's a damn squirrel in my tree, and Vet Bill peed on it last I've seen night. It. I've seen that picture. Yeah. Well, yeah. You want to compare yours to uh, anyway? I, John, futures are up six tenths of one percent on the S&P. If you go above 107th Street, over on the west side of Central Park, sure. that's where the good trees are. That's why you bought yours. Okay. No, no. It's not. no, we went out. We cut it back, and you know, we, you know, they had the dogs on leashes, and we dragged it back. Okay, CPI eight thirty Eastern time. <laughs> I don't think we've gone through the estimates once. So Thank God that for that. Year. Let's do that. <laughs> so a headline year over year, which is probably what ends up in the front page of your newspaper, expected to come down from seven point seven percent to seven point three. On Wall Street, there'll be a tremendous focus on month over month core inflation, just to try and pick up a trend month over month over the last several months. We're looking for that to come at a 0.3% in line with what we'd seen in the previous month of 0.3%. And Tom, just breaking down the estimates yesterday, I have to say pretty much every bank is tightly packed around 0.3%. I agree. Without much difference. I, I agree, and all my radar's up on that as well. I've never seen it where the monthly statistic matters so much, you know, in the calculus of the huge importance. Point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got an expert on that right now. We have been really not giving you the proper report on inflation today with all the distractions of the legal world. We'll continue to follow that. Shanali Basak and Anne Marie Horton in Washington. But right now, to delve into the impact on the market that we'll see at 831, Christina Katmani joins us, Global Debt Senior Portfolio Manager at Invesco. Simply put, what will Invesco watch in this inflation report at 830? You know, I think the market's looking for the details and will we have a follow-on to the October relief, which was broad-based. You had energy come off, you had OER, you had goods <clears throat> come off. And the Fed is clearly waiting for some slowdown in right. inflation. And we need the other side, too. We need the labor market to, to come. But the market has turned so quickly, and the narrative of what's actually pricing in inflation markets is okay. so different. This is critical right now because everybody's focused on the equity market, stock market recovery, doom and gloom out there, 100 percent equity. What part of the bond market has had the responsiveness, the elasticity of a quieter inflation level? What part has moved? I mean, you've you've seen a massive – you've seen break-evens move and you've seen nominals move. But break-evens have moved from 260 – kind of across the board in tens and in two year breaks all I the way to no idea two, she 225 just she's just loaded with jargon I mean, she's just like what's a break even in a nominal um, so nominal rates are just treasury rates and real yields and the difference between the two is our break evens but it's a measure of what inflation we're actually pricing in the market and again the narrative the common theme from our economists across the street our economists but consensus economists across the street is maybe we get to three and a half four percent by the end of next year, um, but we're actually pricing two and a half by June. I mean, it's a very different dynamic than, okay. yeah. Then, then what makes sense to you in terms of what the market is saying versus economists? Yeah. When we talk about the reaction to the CPI print, people think that a softer than expected uh, read would lead to lower bond yields and would lead to higher equity valuations. Do you agree or do you see a potential sell-off in longer-term debt, particularly if people view this as a green flag for the Federal Reserve to pause? So, look, I think it's really interesting, and I think you can survey 15 experts, whether they're traders, street economists, um, portfolio managers, and you ask them the exact same question of what do we get today for CPI and what's the market response? And with a 0.3 number, I've heard <laughs> we have a five basis point rally and I've heard we have a 30 basis point sell off. And I think it tells you that people are there's liquidity issues in the market and people aren't really sure what to do with the actual data and what it means for the Fed. We still have a Fed that's going 50 basis points tomorrow. We've rallied almost 100 basis points off the highs. I mean, these are tremendous moves. People have been talking about the lag effects, too. And some have speculated we only have seen about a third of the overall tightening mm -hmm. impact. And so how do you game that out, given the calls for a pause and then what 
what that read through really is in terms of a dampening effect on inflation. And I think that's why the Fed has tried to move towards this downshift and why we're talking about 50 tomorrow. And there's this chatter in the market. We've gone from this consistency all year of pricing in more and more and more. A year ago, mm -hmm. in November of 2021, we were talking about maybe seeing 50 basis points of hikes in 23. Right. For the whole year. For the whole year. For 22, We've gotten, yeah. We're going to have 50 tomorrow. And what's, this is like our slowdown. What's but, great about this is you're Villanova Finance. Great. And you're totally a bond nerd. I get that. I want you to talk now like a salesperson at Invesco. How many years does it take to recover from the negative 18 percent, negative 20 percent of debt that we've seen in 2022. I get the duration and all the, the stuff you and Lisa are, are encyclopedic on. How long is it going to take for me to get my principal back to what it was in 2019? Look, I think we're in a different we're we're transitioning away from a world of mass global central bank support. And we don't have that anymore. So it's going to take time to recover. Um, and it, it doesn't happen in one year. But we do think that fixed income looks more interesting into <clears throat> 23. But I think the pockets, even in the last two months, have shifted as you've had this 100 basis point rally. Again, I look at nominal treasuries. Tens were at 425. We're sitting at just sub 360. It's a lot less compelling. Real yields offer some value. FX is probably more interesting, but. Are we heading toward a higher inflation regime for a longer period of time? Look, I think when we look back at the year, economists across the board, the Fed included, we've had a horrible track record of predicting inflation. So it's interesting that today the numbers have come so close and we've made this very quick shift to saying we're going to have this rapid deceleration and the market's pricing that and we can get to two and a half by June when we've consistently overprinted. I think the risk is on that side, right? This cycle has been <clears throat> unlike any other. Inflation has ramped up so quickly. Things have moved so quickly. Can it turn around the other way? Yeah, I think it can. But the risks are still two-sided. And the market, I think, is focused on this. And you had this John Roberts piece last week that got a lot of market attention talking about if inflation really does come down quickly, Maybe the Fed, Fed policy rate in June is supposed to be at 1%. It's a very different world than where we're in now, right? But it's not just CPI, it's payrolls too. I think we surprised Absolutely. to the upside for eight consecutive months. And the bias is pretty clear. To your point, Christina, this market is not focused on the next 100 basis points of hikes. This market, and the bias is clear, Tom, this market is focused on the cuts that they think are in our future, maybe 12 months away. I have never seen it like this. I thought Gina Smiley in the right New York now. Times had a debt on yesterday. It's Gina Smiley. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How wrong were we in the last 12 months? How wrong are we right now? Nobody knows. Love Gina Smiley. Just for the record. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, everyone okay. knows. You Christina love. says she I did okay. <laughs> Even if you don't think so. I think Christina's fantastic. Why can, did I get such a half time asking for I'm definitions? I'm fired up. You used to do I'm this with me. I got hate mail. Junk debt. And he goes, I got <laughs> definition I, of I, junk debt. Go. Everyone's as a terrorist. I'll be like, yes, I'm I got hate mail out below. on Twitter. It's <laughs> off the chart. Can we talk about an Wikipedia. adult? What? A public servant for 25 years. He's at Duke University. It's a, it's a school somewhere adjacent to the University of North Carolina. John Reed Stark. He won the award at the SEC for being Mr. Perfect and all that encyclopedic on enforcement. Here he is two days ago, not out with Bankman Free, but out to Binance. Binance is proof of reserve. That's like a whiskey thing, John. Report doesn't address effectiveness of internal financial controls, doesn't express an opinion or assurance conclusion, and doesn't vouch for the numbers. I worked at SEC 18 plus years. This is how I define red flag. That's the most adult thing I've seen in the last hour. I think it's fair to say the SEC is looking at a lot of red flags. Right now, Tom. Yes. And I'm not talking about that particular firm. I'm talking about Bankman Free. I agree. Yes. And FTX. Yeah. They've got a lot to focus on. We have too. We are 34 minutes away from inflation data in America. <clears throat> then after that, the focus shifts quickly to, to a Federal Argentina. Reserve decision oh, I tomorrow. And uh, Argentina. Argentina. Like a little bit later. Yes. Um, Victoria Fernandez it's is going to join us very shortly from New York. Argentina's favorite, right? Well, what's that worth, this World Cup? <laughs> I've got no idea. Christina, this was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. From New York, this is Bloomberg.
Fed is very much on a glide path that is higher for longer. From the Fed's perspective, it's not about whether or not we see negative activity. It's about whether or not we can get inflation on a meaningful downward trajectory. The part of rates is about the labor market, the inflation numbers, and wages. Certainly, at the latest, one more increase at their May meeting. There's the chalk that's about to come, though, into the CPI, into FOMC, and into kind of the, the beginnings of January, where everybody thinks they know what the trend is. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Ramos, and Tom Keen on radio and television. An interesting day for economics. Inflation here in 29 minutes. We'll have a complete report. Michael McKee's in Washington, right, John? He is, so I'm told, yeah. He's there, and we will cover that as well. But we must speak of this historic day for securities law in America. John, were we prepared? I was not prepared for the specificity, the violence of the statement by the SEC on Bankman. Well, first of all, I think what we were prepared for today was was testimony from Sam Bankman Fried in front of the House Financial Service Committee, and that got ripped up yesterday after we found out he'd been arrested in the Bahamas. This morning, the latest news is that the SEC is charging Samuel Bankman Fried with defrauding investors. We heard from Gary <coughs> Gensler, Tom. He called it a house of cards on a foundation of deception. Bruising statement from the SEC. And Lisa's talked about it all morning. Right. It's not just the SEC this morning. We're also waiting for more detail from the Southern District in New York. Let's talk about this detail. From let's, I want to get out front of this story and, frankly, get out front of this important inflation report. Lisa, the distinction here is civil and criminal as a general amateur statement. But what will be unveiled further this morning? We'll have to see, right? We'll parse through some of the it's details. It's that much of a mystery. We don't understand what extra details there are. I will say just some of the details within the SEC complaint indicate some real deliberation, just a, a sort of <clears throat> a intention right. to necessarily create a scenario where Alameda, the privately held crypto hedge fund, as they described it, had an unlimited line of credit backed by FTX. And that is right. really what they highlight. John, the invention of FSA in England is so different than here. If this was in England, if this was in the city, if this was in London, would it be the same process there as here? I'm not in a position to answer that. I think the query that I think we've faced a lot of over the last month is why did it take so long to do something like this? That's clearly in the fair, case, yeah. I think, to be fair, it yeah. takes a while to put together a case to make these kind of allegations and put charges together. The allegation, I think, is different this time because when Madoff, when we went through the Madoff episode all those years ago, Tom, Madoff came out and admitted to it. That was the big difference. We've just had, what, a one-month media tour from Sam Bankman-Fried? And, Lisa, you and I talked about it. I think we got some insight into the line of defence from Sam Bankman-Fried ahead of the charges itself. He's basically claiming, I'm naive, I didn't know what I was doing, yes, I messed up, but none of it was deliberate. And this complaint directly repudiates that by saying that he personally signed off on re removing some restrictions <clears throat> to the line of credit to Alameda, the connection, the interconnectedness that yeah. let FTX funds head oh. toward this other unregulated, out of the U.S. entity. We're going to move on from this, but I'm, and we'll stay with it all morning, of course, Shanali Basak and Amory Horton in Washington, but I'm just going to say I don't do a parallel with Madoff. I think it's no, 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 different. and I'm not Made suggesting up. you should do either, yeah. Tom. I'm just suggesting that a lot of people said, "Well, why did this happen back then, and it didn't happen right. this time around?" And I think the the differences are obvious. Yeah, and and I think that's important as well. We need to get to the data as we get to inflation here, and the data is it's not what you're going to see in the headlines this morning, John. The data is not year over year; it's month over month, and that folds right into the data check this morning. And it's month over month core. You've got to strip out food and energy, and I tell you, the likes of Michael McKee will go so much further than that. So we can talk about the nuance when the data comes out. Going into it, equities up yesterday, biggest one-day pop of December so far. Equities up again today <coughs> by six-tenths of one percent. Do you remember the gains on November 10th? Do you remember the scale of the move that we saw on the S&P 500? It was a monster move on both the S&P and on the Nasdaq as well, off the back of a downside surprise on CPI that day, Tom. And I think we've somehow forgotten some of this. We were up by more than five percent on November 10th, <clears throat> off the back of yep. CPI, which I think just gives you an idea, not directionally, but just how much this market can move on this data point at the moment, Tom. Earlier on, you were talking to Julian Emanuel, and mm -hmm. you said we used to look at money supply, used to wait for the M2 right, data right, on a right, Thursday. Right, right. Then it was all about payrolls. Now it's all about CPI, nothing else. The question people are asking is whether the attention does shift now from inflation to growth. I think it's interesting to hear from HSBC this morning on the growth story. Everyone's expecting it to weaken in the first half. HSBC <coughs> moments ago, Max Kettner published, we increasingly believe 
The widespread belief of a weak first half is misplaced. Activity data is still surprising to the upside. Max goes on to say both top-down, bottom-up expectations this have been downgraded critical. so much in recent months, Lisa, that makes further positive activity surprises likely. And that is the biggest pain trade. And Julian Emanuel saying that that is his scenario that could potentially upend his and many of the other consensus calls in a way, especially if that leads to a much more severe downturn later on. But again, folks, we look at the guests and what they say. And John, help me here. But when we met with Mr. Kettner in London, I believe it was, for the Queen's funeral, Mr. Kettner was shockingly cautious. Yeah, here's Am the punchline, right? though. Here's the punchline. He's still underway equities because he thinks a stronger first half is actually okay. going to generate all kinds of concerns that we had <clears throat> through much of this summer. And the playbook really is August, September all over um, again. And calls for a more hawkish Fed, too. We're going to stay on track here. We're going to do it this morning with you. John, did we do the data check? My head's spinning so much. We did. So I think you were distracted. Flow. But yes, Futures I went through numbers. Futures up 24, up 6 cents of a percent. Futures up <laughs> Numbers advanced. were talked about. Why is the VIX at a 25 on to 26 with the equity markets we're seeing? Did you hear what Julian said earlier? Yeah. He said that cathartic moment. For ish A low, the low is 40. Yeah, He's I looking was for that a bit spike surprised. That's a 40. Also surprised this weekend by the evidence that someone from Houston had migrated up through College Station to Dallas Victoria Fernandez with a sighting at Cowboys Stadium, which they haven't won in 26 years. That's a shock. The last time we saw maybe the cacophony of outlooks in the equity market was, well, maybe 26 years ago as well. She's chief market strategist for Crossmark Global of Texas and beyond. Victoria, I have never seen the jumble of outlooks. You guys are in the trenches on this. What do you say to scared people moving into next year? Well, Tom, I think when we talk to our clients, we've been doing these um, symposiums around the country, and it's their number one concern, what do we do for next year? And we tell them, look, you have to take a, a balanced approach right now. We know that when you look at the economy, we've got some positive elements going. The consumer is still strong. The labor market is still strong. You've got buybacks coming in. You've got seasonality. You have some things that are good foundations for the economy. And on the flip side, it's all the stuff you've been talking about this morning. We know we're going to have slowing growth. There's concerns about earnings estimates. We've seen um, EPS growth estimates come down by about 5.5% so far this quarter. That's double what you typically see. There are concerns, obviously, of a shallow recession. So you have to be tactical and have a balanced portfolio in order to take advantage of what's going on in the market at any particular time. We don't want to be too heavily weighted one way or the other. Bonds are back. How many times have you heard that? Philip Hill brand of BlackRock saying the following central banks are unlikely to come to the rescue with rapid rate cuts and recessions they engineered to bring down inflation to policy targets we are underway nominal long-term government bonds in each scenario in a new regime Victoria can you speak to that call from BlackRock yeah, so look, I mean, Jonathan, you know that I manage fixed income portfolios as well as being our market strategist. And so in our portfolios, we've been extending duration. We've been going in to investment grade corporate bonds. Look at what the spreads have done just in the last month. 10-year financial, 10-year bank spreads have come in almost 40 basis points. So we talked before about getting that duration in because we knew yields were going to come down. We thought spreads were going to come in, and that's exactly what we've seen. Obviously, we think there'll probably be some more widening as we go into next year, but I still think it's a good place where you can invest because you're going to have steady cash flow and you have a maturity date. Fixed income investors, remember, they have an out with their bonds, unlike in the equity market. So I do think that it's a place that you can invest. I think you'll get some good yield, some good cash flow. And when you have a lot of volatility in the equity market, it gives you a place to hide a little bit. So in other words, you continue adding to the position, even though there has has been this incredible rally. We do. I think you have some opportunity there. Now, you have to be smart about it, and you have to do just like you have to pick your stocks in the equity market. You have to pick your places you want to be in the bond market as well. But I think you can find some areas where you buy at positive yield to maturities. You have sufficient cash flow. That's a good place to have an allocation in your portfolio. Victoria Fernandez, as always, wonderful from Crossmark Global Investment. <clears throat> Send our best to Bob Dole. When's Bob back, Tom? It's Bob coming he was back here, on. Uh, he was here a few he's, weeks ago, wasn't he? Was he like a couple weeks ago. It was lights out. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's coming up shortly. Matt Lazzetti over at Deutsche Bank. Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank. So there's been some really great calls this year. I'm thinking of Mike <clears throat> Wilson on the equity right. market. I think maybe Cities, Andrew Hollenhorst, 
coming out very early, Pretty saying miserable. we're going to get a series, a sequence of big hikes, pre on the yield curve. Matt Lazzelli, the first to make the inflation call for 23 before it became very, very fashionable. And he and Peter Hooper and their team not only put uh, the call, but also the X axis on it, their recession call, they made clear it was out there further. It was none of this, it's around the corner stuff. And they were real simple to, to get out to 23 and into 24. Which may be the biggest question for him. Does he push it out even <clears> further? Is he going on the Max Kettner point to raise uh, that Kettner's, you raised earlier? That's a big deal. This question of what does a prolonged recession do? Is that negative or positive for risk assets? Maybe positive in the short term from Julian Emanuel's perspective. Longer term, what does that mean about the nature of the recession? And Neil Dutter of Ren Max got company, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And Neil was not alone. Yeah. I think a lot of people are starting How? to join him just looking at the incoming information. I, I mean, it's completely devoid of this, but the United Airlines is the largest airplane order ever. I, I don't even know what that means. But that was part but of the joke earlier on when we talked about it, it, it right? And Lufthansa's out as well, saying, surprise, it was better than we thought. It was These are two airline data releases. Do you think he flies for free on United? The airline business, though, Tom, to your point, seems to be very unique, that sector right now. The, the amount <laughs> of say. money that people are willing to spend on flying still, well, still, but, this year and into next as well. Why are you well. laughing at me? If people are still willing to spend that, though, <laughs> then what is all this talk about the lack of demand with respect to travel, with respect to the oil picture? If people are prioritizing travel. Was it was it <clears throat> Morgan Stanley that talked about a golden period for some of the airlines into next year? I forget who it was precisely, but yeah. a lot of people still bullish on that segment. They because, want our gold, I'll Because tell you certain that. guys are willing to spend serious amounts it's of really? money. Really? You're just trying to rub it in? business class seats to Paris. So bitter about that. He's <laughs> bitter about that bit dog book. You know, I looked at changing my flights <laughs> next week because of these strikes in the UK and yeah, all the yeah. snow yeah. and all of this mess. My goodness, the charges. Yeah to yeah. change that flight. I walk in the United and over at Newark and they begin to tear up. They're so happy I can tell you, my, my, my <laughs> phrase yesterday oh, evening... Pull out your Good to see you again. My phrase yesterday evening was not, my goodness, because that's not the phrase I would use at I was going to say... How's your remote just, control? You know, <laughs> fixed. <laughs> Is it fixed? I was worried that I'd broken it, but yeah. it's OK. Yeah, it's so ready for the game. It's ready for Argentina <laughs> Crochet. <laughs> so Matt Lizetti at Deutsche Bank, coming up shortly. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. U.S. regulators are adding to the problems faced by FTX co-founder Sam Bankman-Fried. The Securities and Exchange Commission is accusing him of carrying out a multi-year scheme to defraud investors. The SEC also says Bankman-Fried concealed risks and used commingled customer funds. He was arrested Monday in the Bahamas after U.S. prosecutors filed separate criminal charges. Investors are awaiting U.S. inflation data that could shape the outlook for the Fed interest rate hikes into next year. The Consumer Price Index is out less than 20 minutes from now. A subdued CPI number would justify the Federal Reserve's projected half-point interest rate hike on Wednesday. China is warning that it faces a big jump in COVID cases, the country rapidly dismantling pandemic controls, and it's reopening faster than some experts have anticipated. One of China's top health advisors says if the majority of people become infected with just a few months, there will be a severe strain on the medical system. And United Airlines is betting on a rebound in long haul travel. The carrier has agreed to buy 100 Boeing 787 Dreamliners. It's part of a multi-billion dollar order for as many as 300 new aircraft. The blockbuster deal also includes dozens of Boeing 737 MAX jets. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I think FTX is very much uh, an issue for the U.S., given the, 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 the domicile and the, the nature of it. Crypto, that it doesn't have intrinsic value, and that if people wish to invest in it, well, they, yeah, they must be prepared to lose their money. Be prepared to lose your money, the message from Andrew Bailey, the Bank of England governor, a little bit earlier this morning. For us, the top story, less than 24 hours before he was expected to testify before the House Financial Services Committee, disgraced FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried arrested in the Bahamas and facing SEC charges for defrauding investors. Democratic Congressman Maxine Waters, chair of the House Financial Services Committee, had this to say yesterday evening. The public has been waiting eagerly to get these answers under oath before Congress. So the timing of this arrest denies the public 
this opportunity. TK, the politicians complaining, and not just the Democrats, <clears throat> the Republicans as well, because they wanted their moment with this guy on Capitol Hill. Yeah, I, I, I get that idea. But, you know, John, you brought this up earlier, and you're always looking for the angle here on this. Do you really think they timed this around the committee? I mean, they had to. No, I'm not suggesting I think that. I'm asking a question, though. I think the timing of it is pretty curious. Yeah. We've got I, a, I think a hearing you're... slated at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Then all of a sudden he's arrested in the Bahamas, and this morning we get charges unveiled by the SEC. Look, I don't understand exactly what the uh, machinations were. There has to be something about his coming to testify in the United States after being in the Bahamas for a longer time. You wonder what those conversations were like, especially as the CEO, the current CEO uh, of FTX, continues to talk not only with Congress, but also with some of the prosecutors. So there will always be conspiracy theories and people will offer their own suggestions as to why it happened. I was speaking to Matt Miller moments ago about this. There are a couple of theories, of course, and I'm not lending any weight to either of them. One theory is that prosecutors didn't want him further complicated in the case with more public statements. I would argue we've had many public statements over the last few weeks, so I'm not sure how we could complicate it further. It would be under oath, so maybe that would make a difference. Another one, and I think this will be a conspiracy theory on the right, <coughs> is that Democrats didn't want Republicans to shine a light on the amount of money that had been going towards him. But again, we kind of already knew the detail about this. And as for House hearings, I saw a great comment out on Twitter about this, as if denying the opportunity for him to be grilled by these guys. I mean, Let's use that word grilled a little bit more carefully. I think we throw around that rather loosely when it comes to Capitol Hill. When was the last time you saw a grilling on Capitol Hill? Talk? I didn't. I think the British do this way better. Grilling. Way better. I remember the first time I was in the House of Commons years ago. I was stunned at the grilling that I observed in the House of Commons. Versus, you know, we've got to get to our wonderful sure. guests here, but in the inflation report in ten minutes, but. You know, my, my, my basic theme here is I want to talk to adults. I think, Lisa, you're great at this about the legal side of things. I really, do I really care what a politician who's not educated, you know, precisely in the law or precisely in economics or international finance care? Do I really care what they no, think? No, but I think, you know, just to, to kind of balance the full argument out, Tom, I think a lot of people wanted to see this individual, not at a forum, at a conference where people had paid to watch, not at <clears> various <throat> different out. interviews at various different networks, but under oath, making a public statement. And that might have been a little bit different this morning. Also in contrast to the last grilling that I saw, which was probably of Jamie Dimon on Capitol Hill or some of the bank CEOs when they were brought in, especially after the financial good, good crisis. Point. But that's my point. You know, put them against <clears throat> each other and see if there's the same kind of mm -hmm. anger uh, in some of the tone. We will have to see. We have to move the story forward. Michael McKee is going, look, guys, I got exactly eight minutes. Let's go. First, Shanali Basic joins us. Our Bloomberg, Wall Street, Bitcoin, Binance, SBF money, money, correspondent, Tom. whatever. <laughs> Shanali, seriously, uh, Lisa's focused on when we get unwrapped documents from the Southern District Court of whatever. What are you looking for that they could upset this morning as we go to these hearings? We already have that SEC complaint, but to the point you're making, yes, we want to see that unsealed indictment from the Southern District of New York. What detail will they <clears> give about what Sam Bankman-Fried had done, and how will they speak to the potential commingling of assets here? Remember, the interesting point that you guys were making over there is if Sam Bankman-Fried keeps speaking publicly, how does it complicate or add to the case for authorities? A question here is that he's repeatedly said he did not knowingly commingle funds and he did not knowingly defraud anybody. So the question of intent is a consistent question when it comes to Sam Bankman-Fried. Uh, did he know what he was doing? Uh, the case here laid out by the SEC says he has misled investors and that there was a lot of detail that was uh, very, very intentionally left out. Shanali, what will this uh, hearing look like today without Sam, Sam Bankman-Fried attending? We'll hear from the CEO of FTX now, currently. Remember, you guys were talking about lawmakers. I will say something here, though. While many Democrats took money from, I think this is so important, Democrats took money from Sam Bankman Freed for the most part, but his deputies gave very much the Republican Party as well. One of them was giving at the same rate of Peter Thiel and Steve Schwartzman. So uh, there's both parties here that have taken money as well as intense lobbying efforts. And so when you look at the bills that are being passed in Congress tied to any potential future crypto regulation and consumer protections, you do have everybody's hands dirty. And on top of that, it makes it more complicated when you look at where the industry's lobbying efforts have gone. So it's a lot of complications here in terms of pushing the 
the ball forward in terms of knowing the right thing to do to protect consumers. Shanali, we're going to push things forward together in about an hour ahead of that hearing. I'm looking forward to catching up with you. Shanali Basak down in Washington, D.C. For those hearings, we'll catch up with Anne-Marie Hordern as well. We need to focus on one thing. It is seven, eight minutes away. It is inflation data in America. And Mike McKee is going to walk you through what you need to look for in just a moment. Morning, Mike. <laughs> Morning, John. I feel so left out because this is all about the value of your dollar, not your crypto coin. But uh, what we're looking for is another slowdown in inflation still rising, but on a headline basis up three tenths instead of uh, four tenths <clears throat> the prior month and the three tenths gain same as the prior month for the core, which really drops because of base effects, the year over year numbers down to 7.3 percent for the headline and 6.1 percent for the core. Now, something that's it's really interesting that we have just developed here on the Bloomberg. This is your free advertisement. The ECAN system has uh, inflation swaps, which are pretty good at projecting inflation. The Cleveland Fed uh, is an, another organization that does uh, some uh, now casting on what we think we might get. And basically, the inflation swaps are suggesting we could have a downside surprise today to 7.2 percent instead of 7.3 percent, which would raise all kinds of questions in the markets about uh, what the Fed is going to say tomorrow about how high they need to go and how fast they need to get there. Mike, what's the relationship between the labor market reports that we've been getting that have come in hotter than expected and CPI that's been starting to trend lower? Well, that's the problem, according to Jay Powell. The idea is that service industry prices are still rising while goods industry prices are deflating. And the problem for service industries is most of their costs are labor costs. And so they're still having to pay up because a lot of those jobs are not the most attractive and it's been hard for them to find people. So as long as the labor market stays strong, particularly in the service sectors, then they anticipate they're still going to have an inflation problem. Mike, you read my mind on Cleveland. They have two series. They have the now casting series, which has come down. I get that. You were mentioning that. And they also have their Cleveland measurement of core, which again is rolled over. What is the significance of two data points in a row of rollover versus one or four data points? What's the, the, the pro mathiness of OMG two data points where we roll over? Well, two data points isn't going to be pro level. We'll call it uh, extremely experienced amateurs, maybe. Uh, Powell talked about this uh, a week ago here in Washington when he said that uh, we are not as excited by the October inflation report as Wall Street because it is just one month. They're going to want more than two months as well. They're going to want to see three, four months of yeah. declining month over month inflation to give them some confidence that it is going to come down because there's always one offs in this data. We'll look for it today that surprise people in terms of uh, their uh, rise or fall for the month. Mike McKee, you're going to break down those one-offs in just a moment. Mike McKee sticking with us. Coming up on the program, inflation data in America for the month of November. Will we see a cool down in the in inflation data ahead of that Federal Reserve decision? Equities right now up six tenths of one percent on the S&P. November inflation data in America moments away and going into it, a spike in equities, the <clears throat> S&P up by eight tenths of one percent and a move lower in yields on a 10 year by six or seven basis points to 354 on a two year down three basis points to 434. We're looking for year over year headline to come down to 7.3, looking for core month over month to come in at 0 0.3 with the economic data. Here's Mike McKee. Morning, Mike. Morning, John. Well, we get a downside surprise for headline, at least, with uh, the headline CPI month over month up just one tenth of a percent. It was up four tenths the prior month, and the expectation was for three tenths. On a year over year basis, that puts us at 7.1 percent, which is even more of a downside surprise than the inflation index traders we were talking about. On a uh, core basis, we're at two tenths, which is down from three tenths the prior month and 
percent uh, lower than the three tenths that was expected, puts us at six percent, which is uh, lower than the six point three percent we saw in the month of October. Shelter, the largest contributor to the monthly all items increase, uh, it offset de declines in energy prices. Uh, food up half a percent. Food at home up half a percent. So energy down, but food up for the month. Energy down 1.6 percent. Natural gas, gasoline, both declining during the month. Uh, so it does look like we have a downside surprise. And, uh, let's see what kind of market reaction we're getting, Judd, while I look at where guess, we Mike? also saw numbers. <laughs> what do you think's happening? Equities absolutely flying. Similar move to the move we saw last month, perhaps not as large, but we're higher by almost 3 percent on the S&P. 500, a shift higher going into the data, a big shift higher coming out of it. You want to see a move, get to the bond market, bring up twos, bring up tens, bring up thirties if you like. Have a look at the belly of the curve as well. The two years down 17 basis points to 420. The five years down 19 basis points to sub 360. The 10 years down 17 <coughs> or 18 basis points, so let's call it 343. And once you've figured out what's happening with risk and what's happening with the bond market, you can take a stab at what's happening with a uh, euro dollar. 106 handle on euro dollar this morning. 106.35, wow, a move of nine tenths of 1%. So equities firmer, yields lower, and Tom, this dollar a whole lot weaker. Dollar moving, and what I notice here, and I've got to use the shift word, and you've got here not much nuance in the bond market. This, John, is a movement of everything to a lower yield structure. There's not much spread dynamics I'm seeing right now. So the question you would ask this morning, Tom, off the back of this, does this validate the step down in Fed tightening from 75 to 50? I think a lot of people <clears> would say well, absolutely. Does it encourage a Federal Reserve to back away in the same way maybe that, Chairman Powell did in the last couple of weeks. What I would say is you need to revisit the bull analysis on Wall Street, and I would lead with Mr. Chada at Deutsche Bank. I think you've got to say to yourself, Binky Chada, maybe he moved out the call to an optimistic call, but there he was, a resilient bull with others. And you mentioned Neil Dutta and, and economics and, and other optimists out there. But you've got to at least revisit their why. Of, of why this is happening. Me, I go back to disinflation is stochastic. You go up, boom, it gets fixed, and that's what's happening. You mentioned right now. Neil's name and what popped up on my screen. Bloomberg message, Neil Dutta. What's he saying? So, average hourly earnings rose and inflation moderated, which means real incomes exploded over the month. Stronger real growth means what? over time. Neil is pushing back hard against the gloom. I have to tell you, in the market right now, we fade just a little bit, run by 2.5% on the S&P. Mike McKee, when numbers like that drop, you don't trade nuance, you just go, go, go. And that's what we've seen on the screen in the last couple of minutes. Can you talk to me about the nuance, what's happening beneath <laughs> the headlines, Mike, that you see? A lot of things that are happening, John, are things that were expected, and maybe we just need to redefine the word transitory. There, I said it. Uh, we don't know if uh, Jay Powell would, but used cars and trucks down again for another month. This is the third, fourth, fifth month in a row for used cars and trucks to be down. They're down 2.9%. Uh, we're also seeing uh, m uh, motor vehicle insurance up nine tenths. That's been continuing to rise, but airline fares down 3% on the month. Medical care services down seven tenths. Now, this is a methodology change by the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and it was expected to subtract from CPI, and it is doing that. So we're seeing a lot of the return to pre pandemic kinds of price levels here that uh, really are pushing down on CPI fairly quickly. <clears throat> Food still a major issue with food at home up half a percent right. and food overall up a uh, half percent. So Americans are still going to be feeling it, although gasoline prices down significantly. Mike, are we being cumulative this morning, channeling the vice chairman? How cumulative do I feel right now? Well, you're feeling a little bit better, of course, because this is the second month in a row where we've had a downside surprise. Not just that it's come in uh, a little bit, but it's come in a lot uh, on a year-over-year -year basis. Part of that base effects, but part of it, inflation may be fading faster than some people thought, other than Neil Dutta. Uh, and so at this point, it's starting to look pretty good for the Fed. Uh, the question is not what they do tomorrow. That's ratified. They're going to do the 50 basis points. But now, how does that affect... If, if it does, the dot plot going forward and uh, what they think the forecast for inflation is going to be for 2023, that'll have markets readjusting tomorrow, definitely. 
Michael, before we let you we go, before we let you go, is there anything in this data that suggests that there is this rapid disinflationary trend under the hood, regardless of whether consumers keep spending, given that they are still employed and given that they are still getting wage gains? Well, there's nothing immediately that uh, jumps out that would suggest that, that we're going to get derailed by anything. As I mentioned uh, before the report came out, there are always surprises, but there are downside surprises this time, really. And what it appears is that basically the various categories are doing what analysts thought they would do. Uh, the no, the magnitudes may be a little different, but the, the things that are supposed to be declining are declining, and the things that might be holding up are still holding up. So as the Fed makes its forecasts, it maybe has a little bit more confidence about where we are. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Looking ahead to your Fed coverage tomorrow as well. The S&P move fades a little bit. Let me just run you through the price action. We'll go equities onto bonds and then into foreign exchange. Equities now up by just a little more than 2% on the S&P. The move at the front end of the yield curve, we were down 16, 17, 18 basis points at one point on a two-year. We're now down just 10, your two-year 427. So directionally, the move sticks, but the magnitude of it comes off just a little bit. You see a similar move on euro dollar, just about holding on to 106, euro dollar firmer by seven tenths of 1%. I think overwhelmingly right now on the street, Tom, people will still believe this Fed hikes 50 basis points. The question will be asked, though, and I have to say up front, for those of you about to write in, I'm not asking this question because I think they will. I'm asking this question because other people will be asking it. Does 25 go into the mix tomorrow? Do we get any dissent on that? Well, that'll be in a press conference. Yeah, I don't think we see, you'll see a statement. You'll see it in a statement if there's dissent. Yeah, I can, but it's, it's different than Bank of England dissent. To me, Bank of England dissent is real intelligent dissent. Oh, you're saying You're that. codified from Greenspan. <laughs> it's an odd thing. I'm sure the Fed will be super happy with that characterization of dissent at the Fed some. <laughs> futures up 79, Dow futures up a solid 1,000 points, maybe 900 points here from the bottom yesterday. Right now, as we do, we have a conversation with an expert. He has been fabulous out front on the slowdown in GDP. Matthew Lozzetti joins us uh, with Deutsche Bank with one of the great calls of 2023, a recession, but it's out there somewhere. I've got to ask you your arch call. How have you recalibrated your recession call, and how do you recalibrate after this inflation report today? Sure. First, thanks so much for having me. Uh, no doubt, you know, you look at the headline numbers, you look at core, uh, better than expected uh, decelerations in a, in a number of the items. Uh, I think, interestingly, we, we didn't mention it yet, but rent and OER were actually strong. They, they rebounded uh, and bounced back up 0.8, 0.7%. .7%. Those are the sticky items we know are going to be there. Uh, I, I think in terms of, you know, the market certainly doesn't look at nuance at this point, and I think rightfully so, because it's a, a, a lower print. But if you think about some of the nuances here, we, um, Mike mentioned you have medical services inflation in the CPI very, very weak. That's something that sticks with, with us throughout the rest of the year. But it's a completely different story in PCE. And so I think a big uh, question and, and kind of story over the next year will be PC and CPI are going to converge a lot. Uh, they're going to converge a lot because you have different measures of healthcare inflation in, in the two of those. And you're going to see disinflation in both of them, but it's going to be less disinflation in, in the metric that the Fed looks at and the, and the metric that the Fed targets. How do you think Chairman Powell navigates this one tomorrow? Uh, you know, it's, it's one where obviously they can step down to 50 basis points. I really do think that they want to step down to 25 basis points as quickly as they can. And so data of this nature allows them likely to do that in the, in the February meeting if we get another data point like this. And that really then allows them to calibrate policy the best that they can. If there is a path to a soft landing, going to, down to 25 basis points in February helps to optimize that. I think they also want to avoid this kind of stop-start uh, tightening cycle that, that they may have to do, meaning pause only to re-hike at some point. I think they can avoid that the best by stepping down to 25 basis points at the February meeting. This type of data helps that. Well, although I do want to go to Neil Dutta's point, because it is a salient one, that this essentially gives people more money on a real term, on a real basis, in order to spend further, which only prolongs this economic cycle for longer. How do you factor that in to the flip side, the bullish case, which is saying that there is this natural disinflationary cycle that is taking hold and set to accelerate? Yeah, I think it's best to, to think of that through Chair Powell's three different components that in the basket. You know, we're seeing very clearly core goods and dis disinflation and deflation coming in. You know, rent and OER, we think 12 months ahead, given private rents, are really going to be decelerating. It's that third part of the basket that creates a lot of uncertainty and is tied to the labor market and wage growth. And there, I think, you know, core services, ex shelter, what we're likely to see in healthcare and these other components as, as we look ahead. If you're not seeing demand destruction as much as the Fed needs, if you're seeing financial conditions ease substantially on these data, uh, it does make their job harder on that part of the basket. We can still see a lot of disinflation, 
But the question is, does that get us simply from where we are to 3%? How do we get from 3% to 2%? And that's, I think, the more difficult part. I think our number one question for Chairman Powell tomorrow, the risk of doing too little, does it still outweigh the risk of doing too much? How do you think he answers that tomorrow? I think he still leans towards yes, meaning that they, they still want to lean towards over tightening uh, rather than under tightening. But I think the committee is very divided on that, that question. Um, and I, I think he will have to balance that. And the more data we get of this nature, certainly the, the risk balance comes, comes into better balance as we look ahead. You know, stepping back, it's two data points. We're still at 6% above <laughs> core CPI. Uh, they've been surprised a few times in the past. And so I, I think that they will be very cautious about pulling the plug to it. I think that's why I'm fa far more interesting, Tom, in the risk management question for Chairman Powell. Yeah, you brought I, this I, up. agree with Matt. Yeah. It's a couple of months of yeah. data. We'll get the projections for whatever they're worth. But ultimately, the risk management question tells you a little something a and lot, actually, about the bias of this Fed going forward. I agree. And I'd fold into that another phrase, financial stability, which has really slipped away in the dialogue the last number of weeks. It was their big particularly at the IMF meetings. Well, it helps when the S&P's back at 4K, right? People yeah. aren't so yeah. worried about so, financial stability, apparently. We're going to see it. I mean, we've got to continue to advance here. John, are we through highs yet in this recovery? I mean, we, we, we went up no, and we then faded. pulled we back. We faded. We spiked. We pulled back. But, I mean, there's still a move for more than 2% yeah. on the S&P. It's a punchy well, move. Yeah, 2.5% up Yields 102 down by SPS. 14 or 15 basis points right the way through <clears> the curve. Two's out to... Tens and that dollar is, weakness in a mix. Is, Euro dollar one hundred six thirty four. Is Dow thirty five thousand a big deal? It's a massive it's a deal. I've got, I've got my cap ready to go, yeah, Tom. John, very good. You know, I'll get you to nine a.m. Uh, is well, Matthew Lizzetti of Deutsche Bank. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Matt. Uh, this is important. Now we need to get an equity update as well. John, do you want to tell us about the nine o'clock show? I mean, show? I'd love Maybe to, but you were so eager about moving on. Well, I want to move on, but <laughs> continue. You know. <laughs> Carry I'm on. not focused. I'm, we'll I, you, Croatia wow. beat Argentina. You're, you're not we've had, with the new slow that we've had today. <laughs> Shocked. I mean, Troy Gajewski's only book because you want to talk World Cup soccer with him. Does like Croatia Matt have a Hornbeck chance? Too, of Morgan Stanley. That's the tease, is it? <laughs> Troy's here to talk football, FS Investments. <laughs> Matt Hornback to talk about what Gargi's happened with England here for from football. Morgan Stanley. You know. Gargi Chowdhury's given us the preview for tomorrow, France. Yeah. Big that Mbappe looks good. fan. Looking forward to that conversation yeah. <laughs> in the next hour on Bloomberg. You TV. didn't answer my question. Does Croatia have a choice? Does Do Lizzetti, does Deutsche Bank just stop? Matt's not he's, even he's sat he's down. He's literally does it, does, walking does, off the set. Deutsche Bank, like, does the whole place just stop <laughs> at 2 o'clock? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can go now. <laughs> <laughs> can I go too? Can yeah, you I can leave go as well? too. I can leave as well. <laughs> Wonderful. Does Croatia have a chance? Yeah. The answer is yes. Of course they have a chance. Look what they did to Brazil. Okay. Thank okay. you. That's the final word Thank here. Right. Patiently well waiting is Gina Martin <laughs> Adams, chief equity strategist of Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, Gina, as you well know, and I, you know, Lizanne Saunders, I think the other day had the put call ratio out at a gloom, gloom, gloom level. How do I deal with the, the zeitgeist gloom and caution that's out there? And the idea of it's an equity market running away from me. How do I deal with that emotion right now? Yeah, I think it is really about having a long-term view, Tom. I think you could get very caught up in these day-to-day -day swings, particularly in the midst of a massive bear market. When you have extraordinary volatility, it usually is, unfortunately, symptomatic of a continuation of the bear rather than beginnings of an uptrend. So I think you want to be really careful to draw too many conclusions from very volatile days like today is the first sort of lesson learned. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing to consider is sort of what is the appropriate valuation measure for the equity market over the long term? How much do you really want to pay for stocks? We're trading at roughly 17 and a half times earnings. When we look, take out the biggest names in the index, we're trading closer to 17 times earnings. So there is some value in the equity market, but is the equity market at large really cheap just based on this notion that CPI is coming down faster than anticipated? You would struggle to make that argument. So I, I think you keep your eye on the longer term. You keep an eye on the, the appropriate allocation for the macro environment and just think <clears throat> through where you want to add capital to the degree you want to take advantage of the dips. Where are, where are the really long-term upside prospects as an equity investor? Let's say that this is some sort of disinflationary bent that lasts and actually gives a bit of breathing room to the Federal Reserve and perhaps re, uh, reinvigorates this discussion of a soft landing. And we don't get the downward revisions to earnings per share of uh, the S&P 500 early next year like so many people are expecting. Is that a good thing for the stock market or a bad thing? 
Well, first, let's just um, call, it, call it as it is. To say that 7.1% CPI is disinflationary really is symptomatic of the environment that we've been in. You know, disinflation is, is an environment where we're seeing much more contained inflationary prints. So I think that that's why you explain the volatility, right? This is not even close to disinflationary. This is still very strong inflation that the Fed is going to have to continue to tackle. Yes, we like to see it coming down, but it is nowhere right. near a level of comfort. Now, in terms of estimate revision, it is something we watch really carefully. Um, I like to watch estimate revision momentum, and we did see a really strong downdraft in estimate revisions result, uh, as, as a result of the most recent earnings season. You'd like to see that well. estimate revision momentum stabilize first. You will most likely continue to see downward expectations, but the pace of that downward revision is right. actually the most important indicator to watch at Lowe's. Gina, microdata, I know you hate when I do this, but I'm going to do it. United Airlines, the biggest Boeing order since time began. What does that signal to you about the spirit of industrial and manufacturing America? Yeah, I think it's actually really interesting, Tom. It's one of our bigger, longer-term calls as industrials actually popped toward the top of our sector scorecard this quarter for the first time in a very long time. <clears throat> and one of the reasons to be optimistic about industrials is the order cycle. Really bizarrely, at this stage of the cycle, normally you'd be headed into recession with too much yeah. uh, manufacturing inventory, too much excess that had been built through a cycle. And that's not the case this time around. As a matter of fact, we're starting to see, you know, generally stabilizing to improving long-term demand in certain <clears throat> sectors that should power an industrial recovery. You layer on top of the airline story things like, you know, decarbonization, creating a, a wave of infrastructure investment, things like <clears throat> the supply chain management process, creating another wave of infrastructure investment. And you can make a case for order growth to accelerate very rapidly right. over the longer term. After 20 years of no orders, this is a fairly fantastic environment for some of the industrials. Gina Martin-Adams, thank you so much. And again, we've got SPX up 111 points, 2.8 percent there. The Dow up 700 points in futures market. VIX comes in a solid almost three points from that 25 number back to 22.12. It's extremely important that we dovetail in here, first of all, to find the one congressman in America that will root for Croatia today against Argentina, and that would be the gentleman who is the fabric and soul of Dutch America. This is in western Michigan, north of Kalamazoo. It is the second congressional district of Michigan, yes, conservative, yes, Dutch American, but also fixated on the new finance of America. Bill Huzinga joins us right now, Republican from Michigan, thrilled he could uh, uh, join us today. I've got to talk World Cup with you, the Congressman, first, though. You've got to be root after what the Netherlands went through with Argentina. I mean, Croatia has a chance today, right? Yeah, Croatia's got a chance today. Now, I will note that the, uh, the, the Dutch beat the United States. That was a little tougher uh, conversation, but uh, I know all the football talk has gotten me very excited about my Detroit Lions. So well, that's true. Uh, the hottest team in the NFL. So a little different football. But, it is. Uh, I've got, yeah, it's it's going to be a good day. I've got Michael Barr briefing me on that in Bloomberg Radio on a daily basis, a legend from uh, Detroit to the east. Congressman, I must ask you about this meeting this morning at 10 a.m., all the emotion yeah. and all the politics. I want you to take the bizarreness of Bitcoin, crypto, blockchain. How do you explain this moment? to your conservative constituency. Yeah, constituency and frankly, to colleagues uh, as well. And uh, we've, uh, all of us on the Financial Services Committee have had uh, colleagues of ours coming up to us uh, and, uh, you know, and, and not to mention obviously uh, the constituents uh, saying, what is going on with this? And the sad element of this, Tom, is that this situation is creating the conversation which is not a healthy one or the direction we should go, which is maybe we should just ban all of this. You know, it's too confusing. It's uh, way too many uh, options and opportunities to, to cheat, lie, steal in it. So how about we just ban it? Uh, well, that's not going to happen, you know, and, and we, we've got to remember that uh, this is more than just about crypto. It is about the blockchain technology that underlies that, and that is going to be transformative for the financial services, but also health care, you name it. I mean, I, I, my background's in construction and housing. Um, you, you look at uh, what you're going to be able to do in that field uh, with, uh, with blockchain technology. It's all very exciting, but this... Uh, which appears to have all the hallmarks of Enron and Bertie Madoff uh, blended together, named Sam Bankman-Fried, 
uh, that is putting a very different spin on what the, what the conversation has been here uh, in Washington. Congressman, how do you view the timing of the arrest, given the planned meeting this morning on Capitol Hill? Well, um, I would assume, or I would certainly let's hope, that, uh, that Ginsler's revised calendar release yesterday had nothing to do with that. Uh, but I have been talking to a number of my uh, colleagues who were former prosecutors uh, who are saying, well, wait a minute, this, if, if you're giving a, a witness or a potential, uh, a potential uh, mark uh, an opportunity to come in under oath, spend four hours in, uh, you know, just freewheeling conversation uh, with Congress where they might just end up perjuring themselves. Why would you not give them that opportunity? Uh, so it's got a lot of just kind of question marks around that about the timing. Uh, I'm welcome his arrest. I, what I don't understand is why it wasn't a week ago or a week from now. Uh, why did it have to be yesterday or last evening? What do you think would have been accomplished and what do you want to be accomplished at today's meeting? Yeah. Well, uh, and of course, as you know, we're having uh, uh, the uh, the new interim CEO, Ray, is coming in, uh, and I would have wanted to hear his answer. My, the conversation that I was going to have uh, was going to be surrounding uh, FTX.com, you know, the separation between uh, U.S. as well as international funds, and was there a commingling of that uh, illegally, or potentially, if there was uh, U.S. dollars getting put into uh, those international funds uh, like that. I, I wanted to hear hear from both of them what their take was and whether there was a, a, any evidence of that because I want to protect U.S. consumers and I want to protect U.S. taxpayers as well because there's obviously been some calls well, for we got to bail it out, which can't happen. I mean, people have been looking for the Secretary of Treasury, whether it's Yellen or before. I mean, I, you know, this stretches back a number of uh, years and administrations, Congressman, but you got to believe at some point we decide if Bitcoin and all that is an asset. Is it blottable? Can you audit it? And can it provide tax advantage when it has a huge gain to the IRS and such? Are we at that point right now where we need to codify Bitcoin to be an IRS item? Well, I, there is not consensus of that yet. Tom. Agreed. And look, you've got you've got some arguing it's a commodity, some arguing it's a security. Uh, you know, we like things to be either fish or fowl right. here in Washington D.C., and it turns out this is a platypus, right? It's got it's got hallmarks of both, uh, and uh, we we have not reached that consensus. Clearly, uh, uh, Gensler, Chair Gensler, believes. Uh, well, he did believe when he was head of CFTC that it was a commodity. <laughs> he now seems to think it's a security. Uh, but uh, you know, we. We, uh, we are going to have to wrestle with this one right now. Right. I, I should note also, by the way, we have not seen Gary Ginsler in front of our committee in over a year. It was last October. So t uh, Lisa was asking, you know, what kind of questions you would like to ask right. today. I'd like to ask, right. what has the interaction been with the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, leading right. up to this point? And uh, that's a very important thing. Sam Bankman-Fried was here in December of 21. It's ironic that he would have been here more often than Gary Ginsler right. in front of our committee. Congressman, I've got to ask you this, and we do this with all of our politicians, particularly when they're not lawyers. You are steeped in the core industrial process of America, in sand, gravel, crushed stone. That's what you do out in western Michigan. How do we jumpstart investment in those core industrial and housing construction processes. What does Washington need to do to help somebody not busy in gravel right now? Yeah, well, and here's the interesting thing, Tom, is we actually are pretty busy. Uh, infrastructure has continued to go on, and your last guest was talking about that. You know, some of those underlying pressures that normally uh, would have uh, had us going in a different direction as we've seen inflationary pressures still continue. There's still a lot of activity, but we've got to we've right. got to solve uh, this uh, the, uh, the supply chain. Part of that is in, in con construction is uh, is making sure that we've got domestic oil production and world oil production mm -hmm. up because. 30% of a barrel of oil goes into PVC pipe, shingles, asphalt, right. all the, uh, you know, siding, all of those things. So if we're, if we're looking at how to housing and to infrastructure, we've got to make sure that the materials and the labor is actually there and available.
Well, Congressman, thank you so much for your time today from the 2nd District of Michigan. Bill Ozinga, thank you uh, for joining us. We've got to get back to the markets. Lisa's screaming at me. Let's go. VIX in three big figures as well. Lisa, what do you see on the Bloomberg terminal? Right now, I'm looking at the biggest move in 10-year Treasuries going back to November. If you take a look at just how much yields have come in, price up, yield down. You could still look at the NASDAQ up nearly 4 percent ahead of the open, flying on this prospect of perhaps disinflation coming through, making it easier easier for the Fed to step the step away from the brakes <clears throat> and really reassess policy. How do we attach the congressman there who was a gravel business, you know, Dutch American, just core ethos of construction in America, with what we hear from Jim Glassman of JP Morgan is he talks to people like that for JP Morgan every day. Things are not that bad to Neil Dutta, market economics, to what we saw from Scott Kirby at United Airlines today. We're, the recession gloom, it, it's just, you know, which is a reason, help me. Well, which is the reason why Max Kettner goes against the big grain shift. and says, Nailed it. Yeah. we're not necessarily going to see that big downturn, those big downward surprises in earnings per share early next year. Again, though, what does that mean longer term? What does that mean in terms of the ability to beat inflation? Because yeah. we're still coming down from a very high place. An eventful day. We'll have the Fed meeting for you tomorrow and our special coverage in the afternoon. But before that, in one hour with Congressman Hazinga, the Financial Services Committee on Capitol Hill. Good morning.